Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting in 2022 of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. And I would ask all members and witnesses to ensure their mobile phones are on silent and that all other notifications are turned off. The first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take items three, four and five in private. Are members agreed? We're all agreed. We now turn to agenda item two, which is to take evidence on the National Care Service Bill at stage one as a secondary committee. And we're joined today by three panels. Our first panel this morning will be exploring local authority governance and structural issues. And joining us, we have Andrew Burns, who is from the is a member of the Accounts Commission, Carol Calder, who is the Interim Audit Director from Audit Scotland, Eddie Fullen, who is the Chief Health and Social Care Officer, and uh, Eddie Fraser, who rep is a representative from Solis Scotland, and also Derek Yule, a council member uh, and from the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accounts Accountancy, otherwise known as SIPFA. And I thank all our witnesses um, for joining us, and I'd like to begin um, uh, with some initial questions. Um, so, focusing, uh, this is about focusing public expectations following the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'm going to open this out to everybody, but just to say that we only have an hour. And so, my colleagues and, and at times I might focus on our questions to one person. It might be questions that are just relevant to your work. Um, so, a general question for everyone. Do you agree with the Feely review that the COVID pandemic, quote, demonstrated clearly that the Scottish public expect national accountability for audit social, uh, adult social care support and to look to Scottish ministers to provide that accountability? So, do you agree with that? Anyone want to pick that up? Sure, Derek. Thank you. Uh, and can I just clarify that I'm here representing the Institute. I appreciate there's been a couple of groups who are affiliated with SIPFA, the professional organisation of directors of finance, uh, but I'm here representing SIPFA itself. Thank you. I, th I think it's a, it's a difficult one to answer because obviously the, the, the immediate focus is on uh, the impact of the pandemic. I think we would look further than that at the, the wider implications of how social care is provided in, in this country. And I think in a response, we've highlighted some, some advantages and disadvantages of a, of a national system. Uh, overall, SIPFA has pushed for sort of local democracy and it's acknowledged that uh, proposed, proponents of subsidiarity and place-based decision-making. And I think you'll probably hear from other submissions that there's a lot of benefits to be had from looking at local solutions for particular issues because Scotland faces a lot of challenges that are different in different parts of the country. And I think that is the challenge uh, if you look at national decision, lack, national uh, conditions uh, and put, putting forward proposals on, on that basis. I say there are advantages and disadvantages uh, from, from both models. Add Eddie. Yeah, I do. Yeah. No, you don't have to do, oh, anything. Don't have to do anything. They will sorry, do it for sorry, you. Sorry, I'm just getting everybody confused. Um, just, just to come at it from a slightly different angle, I mean, there's no doubt that the pandemic has had a huge impact on the social care system as it stands, you know, um, uh, and, and clearly, um, you know, we know, for instance, that providers currently are under a huge amount of pressure, financial pressure, the cost of living crisis has added to that. And from a causal perspective, we were very clear that we, we agreed with many of the things in Philly. Um, uh, you know, and you know, if, if you look at, we've got a joint statement of intent with, with government where we're looking at, um, yeah, yeah, we're looking at things like you know, improving pay, fair, fair work terms and conditions, and then to residential charging. You know, so there was a lot in that that we agreed with, and you know, unpaid um, uh, breaks for carers and stuff. So, but what? What we never agreed with was the, 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 the almost the centralisation of services and, and that the transfer of staff and assets and functions to a national a national body because our view on that really was that was that was that actually going to add and add to the kind of reform of social care we didn't think so so um, but I think just to kind of add to that 
you know, the, the, the bill as it stands at the moment is a framework bill, so it's really difficult for us to kind of take a view on what the impact of that will be. So I, but I think there's a I should really press home the point. There's a lot of work going on at the moment that we're doing with local authorities are doing with government and a whole range of areas that Feely touched on. But that point, just that point about the shift of staff and accountability to ministers is the one bit where we're a bit stuck. OK, thanks for that. Uh, Andrew and then uh, Eddie from Solis. Thanks, Kevina. I mean, just to build on some of the points that Eddie and Derek have already made, I mean, in the quote you read out from Feely, there's a lot to agree with in that. Um, and from the Commission's perspective, from a local government perspective, that you know, we've um, not argued against what Feely recommends. But as um, Eddie's just indicated, this is a, a framework bill. We don't have any details of the secondary le legislation. The, the financial memorandum is now many, many months old, and a lot has happened in the last few months in terms of energy prices uh, and inflation that has significant impacts on what's even in the framework legislation at the moment, let alone the secondary legislation, which is yet to come. So whilst there's a lot to welcome and to agree with in um, what Feely recommended and said, as you quoted, uh, convener, there's also lots of questions. and There's a real, there's a real concern that we have as the, at the Commission that the urgent requirement for reforming uh, social care right now is distracted from by uh, months, if not years and years, of uh, bureaucratic reorganisation. And I think there's a real significant danger in that. And we've evidenced in our sub joint submission with the Auditor General some previous examples of how national organisations such as police and fire have had challenges. And we've, you know, I think the government and the parliament needs to be really, really mindful of the lessons that uh, have hopefully been learned from those reorganisations. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that's very helpful. I think that, that the point about the financial memorandum being uh, old and a lot has happened um, is something to, to be aware of. Um, I'm just going to move on now. I'm oh, sorry, yes, Eddie. Yep. Okay, uh, <coughs> thank you. I, I think, you know, uh, committee members will see in the, the solid submission, you know, we recognise that there is a role, you know, that for Scottish ministers uh, in terms of a national care service. And we've never argued against a national care service. But what we say is, what's the role of that national care service? What's the role in terms of setting national standards and assurance? Some of that around national workforce planning, you know, some of the, the developments around ethical commissioning and procurement. I think where we differ you know, then is about, you know, then moving towards more engagement and taking away from localism and people knowing their local system and doing things to meet uh, that, that local system. So, again, like others have said, you know, like it's a short statement, but it's quite complicated. And I think it's complicated is because we think there is a role for a national care service to set the overall framework and standards. But when actually you get down to how you deliver that on a local level, then local people and local systems know how to deliver that in a local level. And so I think it's, we need to take it both into account. OK, thanks for that. Carol? I would agree with that. I think th your original question was about accountability, national accountability. I think there has to be national and local accountability. And I would ask uh, to what extent a national care service would fit with other policy objectives around community empowerment, local governance, the European Charter of local self-government. And I guess, as Andrew said, the case hasn't been proven yet. There, we don't have enough information to say whether or not a national care service will deliver better outcomes. So I guess my question would be, how? How is it going to deliver better outcomes? What is the evidence base to show that this, this structural change will improve outcomes, will shift to a preventative agenda, early intervention? How will it be better for people locally? And I think that's something that may be more apparent when we see the business plan, but at this point, it's not clear how it will deliver better. OK. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to move on to the role of local authorities specifically. And, and you know, do you think care services should continue to be delivered by local authorities? And if so, could you expand on what the benefits are and what the challenges are with the system as it currently, um, as it is currently? And, and, I'd be, and I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got any experience on rural and island local authorities as well. Eddie Fraser. So I should first of all say, you know, my background is in social work, social care for the past 35 years. 
uh, first of all, managing, managing social care services, then as a social worker, chief social worker. Um, so, social work and social care is not delivered only by the social work department or the health and social care partnerships. You know, we're absolutely engaged. You know, in terms of what I would call everything from well-being through social care, community health, and on into health, other health services, and that engagement is really important in local communities. If I think of my own local communities, you know, in East Ayrshire, you know, in rural areas, we tend to find the vast majority of our, our social care workers are employed by the local authority. That gives a level of consistency. It's also, you know, in terms of economic growth, something that, that we do. So again, it's engaging across a whole community planning partnership eh, in terms of, of what we do there. Remember, this bill is not only about social care, it's also about social work. And in terms of social work, again, both in directly in the solace eh, return and in the return across chief officers groups in terms of public protection, you know, we've had some, you know, concerns around the removal of, you know, responsibility of social work from a local authority level to, you know, a national level. So again, one of my roles as a chief executive of council is I chair the public protection chief officers group. So this is not just about changes to social care. This is about changes to child protection, adult protection, MAPA, you know, violence against women. These are all within this bill about removing from, you know, a local context into a national context. And again, we'll set out the papers where we think there's significant risks about changing that accountability. Thanks for that. Anybody else? Andrew and then Eddie Fallon. Um, thanks, Kavina. Maybe, maybe just to broaden it out, I mean, I wouldn't comment in detail on the, the policy per se that the, the government's putting forward. It's, it, the government's entirely within its rights to put forward whatever um, policy it wants to, and it's up to the parliament through its committees to scrutinise that legislation, which is what, you, what you're doing. But just in terms of um, the wider implications for local government from a commission perspective, I, I mean, th this, as Eddie's outlined, this will have significant ramifications for the local government family, right across all 32 local authorities. And in, in our joint submission, we, we make it clear that, that because it's a framework bill, because we don't have the secondary legislation, we can't be absolutely certain of the full ramifications yet, but they will definitely be significant. And there's probably going to be a gearing effect on smaller local authorities, just given the nature of the size of some of the small local authorities. Um, and if you think about the fact that um, now, I think I'm correct in saying that uh, Audit Scotland's annual review of local government just released a couple of weeks ago indicated that just shy of 24% of local government funding is now ring-fenced. That's compared to 18% just 18 months ago. That's a 30% increase in less than two years. So 24% of local government funding is already ring-fenced. If this, if this um, National Care Service goes through Along the lines of what's in the framework bill, you know, a lot to be decided through the secondary legislation, it could have a major, you know, almost existential impact on, in particular, small local authorities. And I think the, you know, the Parliament needs to look long and hard at that. And Carol's already made the point about how does it fit in with other elements of what the government's proposing, the local government's rev governance review, for example. Great, thanks. And um, who did I call on next? Eddie Fallon, yeah. Very much. Um, and I think just just to build on both what Andrew and Eddie have said, I mean, one of the where we've got the kind of there's a lack of clarity in the bill about the role that local authorities will have in being either a commissioned service or commissioners of service. Now, if it's going to be, you know, and I think I, I reckon the, the bill saying it will be they would be commissioned to provide services. If we're if we're removing. Um, you know, the 75,000 staff, if Spice have said, and potentially the assets from local authorities, there's, there's no real, doesn't it really create an incentive for them to be a, a, a provider of social care services? And equally, um, you know, if, if they were, they're not, really, they're not really on a level playing field because the terms and conditions in local government um, for staff uh, providing social care, and we are working on this through fair work, are better than they are in the private sector uh, and in the third sector as well. So, um, so that's not really a level playing field in which to be uh, a provider of services. And there's a real risk there um, that local authorities, and I think the legislation provides for the fact that they, you know, they can choose to be a, a provider of services. You know, they don't need to be a provider of services. And the risk is, is that they choose not to be. Um, you know, if we remove the kind of core assets from local government. So, and if they choose not to be, then you have to ask yourself the question, who is going to provide social care in Scotland? 
You know, now the private sector in Scotland and uh, the third sector in Scotland do a great job. You know, and we work in partnership with them. You know, but the capacity of those sectors to provide the social care that we need is going to be grossly impacted, um, uh, potentially, potentially grossly impacted by by the legislation as it stands at the moment. And that's a real concern for us. A real concern, um, particularly given the pressures that are that are on the system at the moment. So. Thanks. Thanks for that. And Carol, I think you wanted, did you want to come in? Yeah, just to say that um, something does need to change. And as Andrew said, we wouldn't make a comment on what the policy about what that change is. That's for the Parliament to decide. But the current issues that face the sector right now need action right now. Now, a big structural reform when services are in a stable position is difficult enough and our reports have shown that and, and sometimes reform doesn't necessarily deliver the expected benefits certainly not in the short term um, but the, the, the sector at the minute is, is really struggling um, and I think there's an element of uh, uh, picking up on, on other comments about the linkages with the other social determinants of health and the other services that councils provide, how will those linkages with housing and education, and you mentioned MAPA, um, that all, all those other services that are important to health and social care, how will that be maintained? But I suppose my, my, my point really is that structural reform isn't necessarily going to be the solution. The solution is going to be sustainable funding. It's about meeting unmet need. It's about developing the workforce that can deliver that, um, whatever structure you happen to have. Thanks very much. OK, I'm now going to move on to questions from Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning. And that very comment there is really the question I had in mind for you, Carol. Um, the Audit Scotland Social Care Briefing did identify a number of issues, most of which were urgent and requiring attention. How does that then sit alongside the plans to implement the National Care Service? Can they both run in parallel? Clearly, the National Care Service is going to be a longer term change, but you've identified in the report that there are some urgent actions required. So could you just expand a little bit on what the concerns may be to, to tackle some of the more urgent pressing needs that, that we need to, to look at? I think the Auditor General said that he, he described the services in a precarious position right now. And as I say, funding is a big issue, workforce is a big issue. Running that alongside developing a national care service, where is, you know, that's have a cost implication. There's double running, there's transitional costs. Have they been built in? We also know that from the, the EBR that um, for 400 million for, for is, the national care service is going to be rephased, and 400 million from that budget is going to be to cover a 7% increase in the pay, which has not been agreed. So that might get bigger. So, how how we're going to tackle the here and now issues that people are experiencing with the service alongside double running, the structural change, the transition, uncertainty for workforce and for local government in terms of their planning, their financial planning, recruitment, all of that is, is an, an enormously complicated thing to do. And as I said, with, a, with stable services, reform is never easy. But with, well, nobody's stable at the minute, are they, really? I mean, everything is, is difficult just now. So uh, it, it will, it'll take resources. And it, it's not clear from, and I, I recognise it's a framework bill, but it's not clear from the bill what costings have been put around that, keeping the services going, improving them now and shifting towards a prevention agenda as well. That doesn't happen overnight. How is that going to work? So I think we just need to see more detail of the business plan of, of how this is going to improve services. But it, and it's, it's not just about improving services, it's about improving terms and conditions. It's about making a change in the way services are delivered as well. So it's very difficult to do all of that alongside delivering the services just now, particularly with the pressures that they're under. OK, OK. And uh, perhaps um, on the flip side of this, um, and this is a question, I think, for COSLA and Solis, uh, the, the Audit Scotland report did identify that a huge amount of money is spent, public money is spent in social care. Uh, we know that. But progress in moving to that more preventative approach to delivering social care has been limited. Those are the words from the Audit Scotland report. So what would your views of, of that be, Ed, both Eddie's, in fact, to, to make a comment on that, perhaps? to go first, uh, Mr Coffey. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think 
you, you know, I, I, again, I can, and I think about integration in the, in, the, in the broadest sense here as well. That you know, we've, we've been through. You know, you tell you we've been through a pandemic. We're now in a cost of living crisis, and and and, and a degree progress. You know, progress has 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 been limited, but you know, a lot of that is down. As, as Carl said, a lot of that will be down to investment. Um, you know, and the amount of investment that needs to go in. Um, it, you know, so even at the moment, you know, we've got uh, we we're working around, you know, um, uh, fair work, and the difficulty with fair work and, and the improvement in terms and conditions is the complexity it's the, 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 that lies within it, and that's what's that's what's taking time. Now, I know, you know, colleagues from 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 trade unions and elsewhere get genuinely get frustrated and, and and totally understand that frustration in terms of how we how we deliver on those you know but if we even even if you look at just fair, one one element of fair work you, you know if we were to you know if we were to kind of raise wages in terms and conditions in one area say social care that has a knock-on effect in other areas it, and the example that we would often use is is, is, is early years in childcare where there's a, a kind of equivalence in terms of in terms of the workforce so so you say so progress has been but you know i mean there are things you know, there are things that we're working on at the moment that, that, that we need to progress, and we do need to progress them quicker. You know, we need to, you know, we need to think about non-residential charging, you know, uh, and, and what we do about that. Um, but I, th I think what for, for us at COSLA, you know, the, all of this work is going on in the background, you know, but the the National Care Service and the debate around the National Care Service is kind of taken away from that almost. You know, we've got that focus on on structural change. One of the, you know. And, and a good example, you know, is um, a, um, the recruitment and retention. You know, we've got a huge recruitment crisis in social care at the moment. It's a, and, and, and sometimes it almost feels intractable, you know, but we know we're working with government. We're looking at things like, um, you know, um, overseas recruitment. You know, we're looking at how we can make that the, the profession uh, and, and that area to work more attractive, um, you know, and again that links really heavily to to, um, to terms and conditions and pay, you know, and those are really sticky and complex issues, and that and that's what takes the time, you know, that and the fact that we've also got a fairly you know a fairly tight fiscal environment in which we're working at the moment. Okay, Eddie. So I mean I think you know both the bill and the, the policy memorandum says repeatedly that there isn't capacity to show improvement in the current system. You know, I mentioned earlier how long I've worked in the current system, and I've worked in the current system when Care at Home was home helps, 9am to 1pm, Monday to Friday. If you had a significant learning disability or mental health problem, you lived in a, an institution. I think we're not speaking up how you know progressive our social care system is in Scotland. Our social care system in Scotland predominantly People live at home and they're supposed supported at home and we've seen huge progress. You know, our work uh, around self-directed support is again some of the best in the world. I accept that there is an implementation gap between the policy intent and what's happening there. But the issues uh, instead of us looking at why is that, you know, why is that and how can we improve that seems to be getting lost in terms of looking at structural reform instead of looking at the, the improvement uh, that we need to, to, to do there. I also think, you know, when you start to link, you know, different bits together, and I spoke before about wellbeing and, you know, in our local area, how much, you know, we invest in, in wellbeing. We're seeing more investment uh, in terms of wellbeing and peer support. Uh, and alcohol and drug services to make a difference because the traditional things haven't you know worked for us so, so things can change uh, in terms of, of, of how we, we we do that but at the core of it is also about you know value in social care and if people see social care as only a means to actually support a health service then we're not valuing it for what it is and valuing it for supporting people in their own you know local communities to be as independent as they possibly uh, can be and when we do value it and we can recruit people into that, then you have capacity and care that actually if people need to move about the system, transfer from hospitals to community, then there's a capacity for it. If you've got big waiting lists in the community, then it becomes very difficult to do the transfers or care out the hospital. So, so the whole things are, are very linked, but it does get back down to when you first said about what's the capacity in terms of the, that well-being, that preventative part, you need to be able to invest in that. You need to be able to invest in our, our tea dances, our learning disability awareness tap dancing, and all the things that you know. You know, sorry, 
Councillor Coffey is my local MSP. Uh, all the things that, that, you, that you know that we do there and the preventative end has to be done to prevent me people needing the social care and therefore take the weight off of the, the further up. So absolutely one of the dangers that we see here is that if we separate off social care from wellbeing, you know, where will be the incentives and systems under financial you know, stress to actually cross invest in these types of things? That would be one of the risks that we would see. Okay. Thank you very much for that. It's important to let other colleagues come in, but thank you for those responses. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Um, we're now going to move to questions from Paul McClellan. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, my panel. I suppose I'm coming from this with 15 years' experience as a councillor and also a previous council leader. Uh, the Deputy First Minister asserted that there are significant variations in performance between different local authorities. So how can witnesses account for dis disparity in performance, and how do they suggest that the Scottish Government and COSLA address these? Um, I'll probably come to uh, Eddie first of all, if that's okay. Eddie Fraser. So, I, I do think that there, there are differences, and uh, when you look at different systems, you know, there's not one reason, you know, why there, there would be differences. So, the reason there would be challenges in Highland would be different from the reasons there would be challenges in Edinburgh. So, again, I'm back to you know the, the local systems. Within the current arrangements, the Public Bodies Act, you know, there are there are means to hold you know, integration joint boards to account. So if a health board and a council don't think an integration joint board strategic plan is delivering what it is, it can be called back and asked to be, to be done again. If Scottish Government don't think a council or a health board are performing appropriately, they can hold them to account you know, in terms of that. So the, the arrangements can be there for accountability if the current arrangements wish to be you know, applied eh, in terms of that. I would see it, you know, a bit different, I suppose. I would want to work with local systems and see what the particular issues is and talk about focused improvement for, for systems, you know, rather than we can get into accountability and that almost becomes a punitive, you know, type discussion. What are the issues in a local area and how do you support local areas with improvement plans to actually, you know, and monitor improvement plans to, to, to see that? Improvement plans have there been in, in the past? I suppose it's plain devil advocate. How many have been in the past, and, and has that approach worked up until up until now? Now, I appreciate the pressures you mentioned around about funding and, and other issues, COVID and whatever. How many have there been at this stage, and has that approach worked up to the to this to this point in time? I, I think you know that improvement has been done in in different ways. So improvement at times has been done by you know support coming from Scottish government down to, to local levels. Improvement is done at a local level by adding an additional capacity, including you know uh, linking a uh, cause link to that. I think when you get focused support, you do see improvement. I think sometimes the challenges are wider than that. You know, in terms of you reach a point of improvement where it has to really be different, where you need to somehow bring more. Uh, work, you know, workers into the, the system, you need to do things differently. So sustained improvement, I think, has been a challenge for, for a, a, a number of areas. And actually, if you look across the statistics over a number of years, you'll see the same areas, you know, on the whole, have the same challenges. I'll we'll bring in Carol and Andrew, just from an Accounts Commission and Nord at Scotland point of view, just on that same point, around about, you know, the reasons for, obviously, the disparity at the moment, what's gone on in the past, what lessons do we need to learn? from that without actually moving on to you know, the Building National Care Services. So it's really learning from the past and how we can yeah. move forward. So I don't know, Carol Andrew, if you want to, you want to address yeah. that one. Yeah. No, um, th thanks, Paul, for your question. I mean, I think that the, despite, uh, I think, two or three of us already have said that there's challenges in the fact this is just a foundation, a framework um, bill, and we're not going to see the details until we get to the secondary legislation. I'm going to contradict myself slightly by saying there is an opportunity in that to try and respond to your point, in that there is space within the uh, development of the secondary legislation to go forward with a proper co-design and co-creation of the new service. Now, those words sound great, don't they? Co-design and co-creation. Actually making them happen and involving stakeholders uh, like Cosla and Solis and others is, is not always straightforward and, and it has to be followed through. And absolutely crucially, the stakeholders have to in the view, I think, of the Commission and Audit Scotland, include service users. Uh, and I think to be um, uh, positive about some aspects of what the government's done in recent years, if you look at uh, the delivery of Social Security Scotland, the involvement of service users have been, has been exemplary in the design of that service. So things can be done well, um, but it, 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 the, making the, the, the words of co-design and co-creation that are going to come forward in, as part of the secondary legislation that actually happen is difficult, but I think 
for example, as I've said, Social Security Scotland shows that it can be done well uh, with very, very positive effects and, and improvement can happen. But it, it's, it's fundamental, I think, from a local government perspective that stakeholders and uh, service users are properly involved. Thanks for that. Carol, I don't know if you want to touch on just on that point and I'll see if anybody else wants to come in. Then I want to try and move on. Eddie, you mentioned about IGBs, so I just want to move on and touch a bit about IGBs in a wee second. But. Yeah, very quickly, I agree with what Andrew's just said. And the thing is, with community engagement and co-creation, consistency is probably not something you're going to achieve. You know, per, per performance doesn't need to be the same. One size doesn't fit all. There are local priorities, and if they're agreed with local communities, um, and we can understand performance at a local level and where the improvements are and what work is going on to make sure those improvements happen, that doesn't mean it's going to be the same as the next one. So... Um, Variation is not always a bad thing. Variation can reflect the local community needs. Anybody else wants to come on that one, Kavina? Then I'll try and move on to the bit of IGBs. Yeah. Could I just? Oh, sorry. Could I just add? add to that? Yeah. No, and, and just just really quickly, just to um, agree with the points that my colleagues have made, and and you know, and the point that Eddie made around uh, around support. I think I think sometimes, and uh, we need to be careful with, with with the language. You know, I mean, we we hear word, you know, postcode lottery, you know, inconsistency of provision, which suggests that you know there is good and bad. You know, but actually, you know, every area, as Eddie said, will be under different pressures for different reasons. And I think, you know, that I think we need to kind of change that language to the language of support and how can we support areas. Now, and you know, and, and I think back. Um, you know, we kind of worked in the, the, the education arena. You know, there, there, there was a system there that we used where there was a kind of system of peer support that would go into areas and look at where things could improve. So, but I think we just need to be careful that we're not saying that, you know, inconsistency means there's good and there's bad. Everybody's got different pressures and face different pressures financially and, 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 and otherwise. If I could just support that comment, because that, that was the point I was going to make. And I think it goes back to the first question answered about local decision making as opposed to national decision making because in terms of performance you look at qualitative and quantitative measures in terms of assessing that and I think what you have at the moment are different pressures in different areas and local decision making where councils will determine their own priorities and determine how they'll view social care compared to pressures in a whole range of other services and that's where you get that local decision making if you take that away and provide a national service, then that sets different challenges in terms of how that national and local interface works. Over the years, I've worked on a number of authorities. I would have to say, I'd probably say in terms of social care is there, probably in terms of all council service, it faces the greatest pressure, demand-led pressure. I would have to say, I have seen the councils I've worked in actually put more resource and, and support protect the social care service at the expense of other services. I can't say that's happened across the whole of Scotland, but certainly a number of councils I've worked in, that would be my experience. The, the actual local members have made decisions to protect the social care service at the expense of other, just reflecting that, that local priority. I just want to kind of move on just and kind of touch on the Eddie, and I'll come to yourself, Eddie Fraser, first of all. You mentioned about, obviously, IGBs, uh, and IGBs obviously were brought in, and I suppose its impact on local democracy in terms of that, and I suppose democratic accountability through that, that IGBs. Um, not every councillor, as you know, sits on, on the IGBs. There's a limited number that, that's sit on there. So is there an influence for councillors who don't sit on it, first, uh, first of all, and obviously and, and coming back to democratic accountability? How do you think that's worked over that period of time, that the five or six years since it's been brought in? And what's the role of IGBs? Because you, you kind of touched on it on your, your, your answer to the first question. OK. Um, so I, I was a Chief Officer of IGBs you know, from 2015 to 21, and I think it's a structure that, that works very well you know, uh, in, in, in most places uh, for that. So the... the Accountability is obviously both the health board and the um, council appointing, you know, members each onto it, and the council and the health board also being responsible for approving the strategic plan of that, that IGIB. So just now, as you know, the legal responsibility for providing social work, social care stays with the council, uh, with the, for health stays with the health board, and that gets delegated then to the IGIB, and there's levels of accountability there. Clearly, this bill would remove you know, like that, eh, both in terms of the representation, in terms of accountability onto the, the, the IGIB. So there is a, a significant change, you know, in, in terms of, of that. 
and also, you know, in terms of performance reports, every you know, like IGIB provides performance reports back to both the council and to the um, the health board in terms of how they're, they're performing. So, so the the structural links are are there. I still think at times people um, misinterpret the difference between the IGIB, which is a separate public body, and the Health and Social Care Partnership, which is the joint delivery body between the Health Board and, and, and the Council. So people who are Chief Officers are not only the Chief Officer of a separate public body, they're also the, a Joint Director of Health and Social Care. And it's in that Joint Director role they're able to do the delivery model of the integrated services. So I was responsible for not only the local services of, of NHS Air Sonaran and East Ayrshire Council within my patch, but also primary care for the whole of Air Sonaran, you know, for the, the numbers of years. And I was doing that, you know, in terms of that joint director role, not the chief officer role. Now, if doing that, I was responsible to both the chief executive of East Ayrshire Council and NHS Air Sonaran. The legislation is laid out, breaks that. It breaks that integration, you know, it clearly says that the NHS staff will stay you know, responsible to the NHS and you know, the, the council, the, well, the, the staff is, is moving you know, from there. You do not have that joint director post at this stage. I can see where the chief executive of the new board is and understand that. That's almost an equivalent of the chief officer role. But that joint delivery in terms of integration, as it currently stands, there is no plan that we can see that actually delivers joint integrated services. And remember, integration of health and social care was supposed to be about integration from the perspective of people who use services. It wasn't about structural integration, and that's why it's OK that in different places across Scotland there are different ways of structural integration, because the integration should be at the perspective of the person who receives care. Can we, I'm conscious of the time. I don't know if anybody else wants to come on, on, on that one. Kind of localism and, and, and local democracy. You know, the, 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 there is access to local politicians um, more than there is to, to ministers. You know, so if, if, if there are people in that community who have, and it's a really important point to make, if there are people in that community who need to get access to, to somebody who, who, who's, who's accountable to them, then, then, then that, that's much easier. Thanks, Paul. We're now going to move on to questions from Annie Wells. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Solis notes that the bill's financial memorandum describes savings or efficiencies through, the serv through shared services. However, it does argue that it does not acknowledge the corresponding loss of economies of scale for local government. Do panellists have any further insights into that? I will come to Eddie first, Eddie from Solis. So, I mean, if I can give a, a, a couple of examples, you know, like, clearly, you know, like, in, in a council, you've got a legal team. A big part of that legal team's work is actually to support social workers going in and out of, you know, like, uh, court. You know, like, in a small council, you won't have a big legal team. And actually, if you take a few of them away, it doesn't leave that very stable in terms of, of the legal team. The same goes for, you know, like your HR teams, you know, and all sorts of other teams. They structural supports, you know, around about you. And it does reach the stage, and I was giving an example to, to colleagues, you know, we've moved down a line where our social care workers on the whole go about in a, a fleet of electric cars. You know, a big part of our garage actually, you know, like services the, the electric cars. If you take the social care workforce away from the council and um, presuming the transfer of assets, you would need to take the cars off the council as well. It leaves us with a garage that might not be sustainable. So it, it's the size of the council, you know, that is. So th that economy of scale that's mentioned in the financial memorandum that's a positive for the National Care Service, what we're trying to describe, and all these support services around the council, it, it becomes a, a difficulty. On, on a wider basis, you know, depending on what happens around capital debt, you know, again, if you take a quarter plus of the revenue off, you know, like a council, actually the proportion of revenue to capital debt just dramatically changes and becomes difficult. And also, as mentioned earlier, you know, if we have ring-fenced monies, you know, so on the whole, a lot of that's around education, you know, like around that, that stays ring-fenced. So suddenly you're going from 30 per cent, you know, ring fence to that being doubling, you know, almost 60 per cent of your budget becomes ring fence because you've taken the social work element away. So the, the financial structural, you know, issues for the council are significant in terms of the way it's set out just now. 
anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean <clears throat> just on, and, on building on Eddie's point and adding to the, the in terms of assets and, and that transfer assets, I mean, we're aware of you know, some local authorities that are already reconsidering their investment plans as a result of the, the National Care Service. Um, um, and, and, you know, we've even, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, in discussion with, you know, all 32 council leaders had real concerns about the, the actual viability of, of some councils to operate as a council uh, when we're talking about taking potentially a third uh, of the budget away. And, and, and then the other one on assets is it becomes a, there's a disincentive to invest, you know, and, and I think, you know, I said that, um, you know, a lot of services are co-located. You know, we've got locality models all over the country where children's services, housing and education are in the one place. Um, you know, how do we, you know, and, and, there's a, and this is a question I've not got the answer to, but I'm going to ask, how do we extricate that? You know, how do we disaggregate those assets and those staff from local authorities when we're, you know, when at the moment, as Eddie said earlier, we've got, you know, they, they're integrated and working well in, in, in many respects uh, uh, across the country. So, um, and, and I think, you know, I think we need to think really carefully about that. I had heard um, from the Finance Committee that potentially, you know, that would be done on an asset-by-asset asset basis. I, I, I just, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that would be done. But, you know, it's, it's a real concern, and certainly we've heard that from, from all 32. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, I don't want to repeat what the two editors said, but I would entirely support what they said. I mean, a couple of points. One, one thing that's not been spoken about to economies of scale is the question of insurance, because I don't see that mentioned anywhere in the memorandum. Uh, and I think what you have at the moment, it's an area where I believe the government would be advised to take external advice upon. A lot of insurance premium are largely focused on staff costs or staff numbers to calculate the premium. The area of social care is an area where you tend not to have touch with many cases, but those that do arise tend to be quite high value cases, and that can differ quite substantially from other council services which tend to be a large number of cases but of relatively small value. If you remove social care uh, from local government, I think there's a real challenge there to how insurers will view that in terms of ensuring the remaining services within local government. I think there's also a question of insurance cover for social care and a national care service, which I don't see reflected in the, the member financial memorandum yeah. at all. Uh, the other area I was going to say, I think a lot of the focus has been on expenditure. I don't think you can ignore the income side of the equation as well. At the moment, councils are funded by grant, but there's also council tax and fees and charges. And I think the relationship of those three could differ quite significantly if you remove social care from local government. And again, I don't think that that's been explored yet, and it's something that needs to be, to be looked at before... Uh, proposals are finalised because I think there are some potentially hidden difficulties there. Yeah, that's Andrew. Do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm conscious of time. Thanks, Annie, for, for the question. I mean, just briefly, though, and I know I've touched on this already, but I think it, I, I'm really glad you've brought attention back to the memorandum, um, um, the finan financial memorandum, because I touched on the fact that if you look at the Table two, I think it is, where they do the, the, the government put forward the projections for the five years up to 26, 27, when the care service is supposed to come into effect. Um, I mean, the figures are very, very significant, but it's based on inflation plus 3%. It doesn't actually say what the 3% increase includes in its great detail. It just mentions pay and energy prices. And thinking about this globally, you know, this was published in June 2022. Pay and energy prices in particular have rocketed um, uh, since June 2022, li literally in the last five or six months. Uh, and I think all the projections in Table 2 of the memorandum, the financial memorandum, uh, need to be updated. Uh, it relates to the point that Carol was making earlier about the lack of a detailed business plan, which I know is potentially coming forward soon. But all of that will have a massive gear and impact on local government. And the, the, the increases that will undoubtedly come from a refresh of Table 2 that money will have to come from somewhere. Um, and it will have, I think I, I touched on earlier on, personally, the Commission feel a potentially a signif more significant impact on smaller local authorities, just given the nature of the services that they deliver and uh, other colleagues have touched on uh, some specifics around that. No, thanks very much. And I'll just come back to something that um, Eddie from Codless uh, touched on, is about the, the assets as well. 
What is, councils obviously are reluctant now maybe to look at assets over the next four to five years because they might lose them in the next four to five years. Um, and I was just wondering, does anyone else have anything to say on that? What impact could this have on local councils? I would, I would probably, could I turn your question around yeah, the other way? Can, because yeah. I think there's an impact on a, a national care service because if councils are not investing in properties for the reasons stated, that means that the assets that are transferred are going to need a lot of investment and where the money will come from, given all the pressures that have been spoken, I would totally support what Council Commission are, are saying, saying and, and that the, there needs to be a complete updating, not just of the financial memorandum looking at the costs, but also the implications on, on the wider sense. The question of funding capital assets is one I don't think has been answered either, because at the moment local authorities have the powers to borrow to finance capital expenditure, how that would operate under a national care service model is unclear as well. That's great. I think both answered the question. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Annie. And we're now going to move to questions from Miles Briggs. Thank you, Camino. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to follow up some of the questions um, which were highlighted in the briefing from Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. Specifically, um, in your submission, the directors of finance argue that issues facing the current system are a product of underfunding by the Scottish Government. However, in the same submission, it states that councils now are spending around 20% more on adult social care and children's services than they did 10 years previously. Audit Scotland's assessment is that the pace of change has been slow and the performance of current services is variable and there's a significant service areas are not meeting expectations. Um, so I just wondered in terms of these two statements, um, if you wanted to comment on that situation currently and, and the impact National Care Service is likely to have on that. Derek, as I Obviously, I think we've probably touched on this in some of the, the previous sure. answers. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's an area service under substantial pressure for the, the reasons that have been, have been stated, uh, particularly uh, around the demographic changes and demand for services. It's an increasing cost pressure that has not been mirrored in the level of funding for local government. And it, that probably relates to a point I made previously about then how each individual council has managed that pressure and how it's prioritised resources for social care, uh, potentially at the expense of other council services. As I said, from my own experience, that's what I've seen happening. I can't really say across the whole of Scotland. But that is the, the biggest challenge. And I think going forward, the, the financial memorandum talks about a 25% additional investment in social care. It's not clear in my mind what's meant by that, whether it's additional financial resource to meet that growing demand for services or whether it's to invest in the preventative side. And I think we would certainly push the argument that you need to invest in prevention to actually see some of the changes that will need to happen in the wider care, care sector. And I think there is a difficulty at looking at things in isolation uh, because you have the pressure on the NHS as well. And our concern is the government have already stated a policy to protect the NHS. It's now contained within this bill proposal to increase investment in social care. To me, that raises a big question then, what happens to the rest of the public sector? Not just local government, but the wider public sector as, as well. Uh, I, th I think, as Andrew said, since June, We've seen the Scottish Government have an emergency budget to find half a million pounds, sorry, half a million, I wish I've only it was, <laughs> half a billion pounds uh, of savings. That's been followed up in the last couple of weeks by further 615 million, I think. That emphasised the challenge that the Scottish Government's own budget is facing. So to, to try and square uh, that equation is in incredibly difficult at this time. That's why I think we have voiced concern about the financial memorandum and not understanding or having the, the objective to, to analyse what's behind the numbers that are there, but also to challenge some of the assumptions that are in the paper about increasing costs over the, the, the next few years. 
and that just emphasised to me the risk for the wider public sector of committing to that additional expense, which, as others have said, potentially is swallowed up by structural change rather than being directed to frontline service delivery. Thank you. Is anyone else on Carol? I agree with um, De uh, Derek, yes. Uh, Eddie, it would be easier if you're all three called Eddie. Uh, <laughs> 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 Apologies, Derek. Um, I think it comes back down, comes down to demand outstrips the funding um, and because of the demographic change. And if you look at our local government overview reports that the Commission produce every year, you'll see how the funding to, is, is directed towards social care and education. And the smaller services, which I say, um, knowing that 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 term, I don't like that term because it diminishes the importance of other, the, all the other services that councils provide that are very important and have impacts on, on health and well-being. But those services have seen between 25 and 35% cuts um, over the last few years. And so, which just goes to show how much funding is being um, channeled into social care alongside education, but it's not enough because of the demographic change. Anyone else want to comment? If, if not, I'll move on to my final question, which was regards to, you know, the National Care Service is going to be a huge top-down reform. And we've seen this previously, 10 years ago, with Police Scotland and the Fire Service. Um, what learnings do you think have taken place within government from some of the mistakes which happened 10 years ago? And are we going to see those repeated in terms of this national centralised service? Who would like to start on that? Let's start, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can't comment, Miles, on what learnings have been taken. I mean, that would that, that, be for you as parliamentarians to judge whether the government has learned. But I, mean, I think I've, I have given some example in answer to Paul's earlier point about Social Security Scotland. I think that has been done well in terms of involvement of service users and stakeholders. Um, that clearly, I think you, you can see from the work that Audit Scotland, the Commission has done over the past five, ten years, that clearly wasn't the case with some other national reorganisations like Police Scotland and, and the Fire Service. I mean, without going into all the details, I mean, there clearly were um, aspects of those reorganisations which didn't go as well as latter examples that I've just referenced, like Social Security Scotland has gone. So that, that's potentially a positive that, that some lessons have been learned, but it's absolutely crucial, given everything that everybody said about the scale of what's been proposed here, that that is done uh, in the same way for the National Care Service Bill if it goes ahead because in its current form. Because if, because if we have a repetition of what happened over other organisations, then the consequences are really, really significant for you know hundreds of thousands of people right across the nation. Um, I can't answer your question about whether you're going to see the same again, but what the, th the types of things that we've been reporting on around reform are to have clearly out set out what the benefits are for that reform, mm -hmm. evidence-based decisions, realistic costings, um, robust, and by robust I mean comprehensive and reliable data, um, impact assessment about what, what, what might happen to local government in this case, in, in terms of this reform, a route map, to how you're going to get to where you want to go to um, and keeping people at the heart of, of designing those services and governance that's, that's around outcomes, delivery of outcomes and prioritising that, longer term financial planning, long term workforce planning um, and accountability tr transparency. Quite a lot. <laughs> I have a longer list. I think. <laughs> I think I support what Carol's saying because I'm not sure that happened the last time. So in terms of lessons learned, I think there's the debate. Those, that's exactly the sort of analysis we need to have. What I was going to say, and it's not really a case of lessons learned, but I think the financial memorandum highlights the same challenges that we experienced with police mm -hmm. and fire that would be faced by National Care Service. VAT is an obvious one. I think the challenge around pensions is a bigger challenge mm -hmm. than it was under police and fire for the simple reason that the staff uh, in social care are part of the local government pension scheme. Police and fire had their separate pension scheme, which was largely funded on a pay-as-you-go basis. The local government pension scheme is one that is self-financed. And I think, as we recommend in our submission, that needs professional advice to look at that. But I couldn't understate the significant challenges that that presents 
for pension funds in the current form and that transition to a new organisation. I think the big question mark would be the status of a national care body, what it would be, and I, th I think as government will be aware what happened with police and fire, I think it took four or five years with discussion, negotiation with the Office of National Statistics, I think it is, that determines the classification of the organisation and in the meantime, costs that are currently offset, like VAT being able to be recovered, that's potentially lost uh, to the Scottish uh, bu budget. So, uh, whether it's lessons learned, but I can see us facing th those same problems again. But I would stress pensions, I think, is the big area where there's a difference from what happened under police sure. and fire. Yeah. Thanks. Eddie. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't... I can't comment on the on, on lessons learned or what lessons have been learned in, in government, but I, I, I think what I, what I wanted to say though is that the 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 uncertainty that the the potential transfer of staff is creating um, is, is 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 a big issue, you know, um, and 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 from a causeless perspective, we've been very clear that we need to focus on the system now rather than on that structural change. Because the challenges that we face in the system, and you've heard them here today, are significant. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been lobbied quite hard by our trade union colleagues. You know, um, as is the employer organisation. Um, you know, um, to, to to take a particular approach around that, and we agree with them that we don't want to see that transfer of staff. So, so, um, and and, and that will be different from police. You know, because the the the, the workforce is so diverse mm -hmm. in local government, um, you know, uh, and it doesn't just include the workforce who actually work in social care or social work, but you have to think about the back office functions, you know, and all the support structures that are there as well, and the instability that that can cause. So um, I think that's just an important point I want to get. Thanks, Miles. Um, and uh, just before we move on to a question from Mark Griffin, I just want to say that we're almost at half past. I hope it's okay if we go over about 10 minutes. Um, because I think this is really important information and we've got three more questions to ask you. So, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kamina. I, I wanted to talk about the, the impact on essentially the council services that would be left behind after a nas national care service. There are you know, syner synergies in place um, in local government services that work well together by having everyone all under one roof. What is going to be the impact on the, the services that are left with local government if, if this goes ahead. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically housing um, and education. I don't know if we can come to Eddie Fraser first and then Eddie for yeah, So as, as an example around um, housing, you know, many councils have, you know, uh, housing build programmes and the housing build programmes uh, are quite heavily focused on people with additional support needs and for, for older people. And the unit cost of actually building the houses is actually significantly higher than building mainstream, you know, uh, housing, you know, but we don't recharge any of that money back to, to, to social care. We don't say we build this type of housing. It actually reduces the cost in the social care budget. And therefore, you know, how do we cross subsidise that? We don't, we don't do that at, at, at this stage. So the issues for, for housing, even on that basic level of house building, are important. The issues, and once you get into some of the other areas of work that we work closely with housing, is we need to be very clear about what happens in terms of housing adaptations that are currently you know, delegated to IGIBs, but we actually delegate it back again to the, the Council in, in, in terms of how it works. Maybe more significantly, you know, MAPA, multi-agency public protection arrangements, I guess in housing are work absolutely closely with social work and, and, and police in terms of how we, we manage you know, people in the community and how we share information eh, around eh, all that. Even you know, things as basic as, and it's different in different places, but all our community alarms you know, are actually run by our housing service that is full of social care data eh, that's within that in terms of that. It's hard to overemphasise how, you know, entwined and integrated services are, you know, within eh, a council. You know, the preventative, you know, services eh, that are delivered out there, whether they be activity services, lunch clubs, etc., on the whole, in my experience, are no longer delivered by social work, social care. You will find that they will be delivered by leisure, or for us, we would call it vibrant communities. So, so there's someone else out there delivering that preventative, you know, work that again 
you know, keeps people as independent as possible as they can in the local community, but also prevents spend on the, the social care, you know, like budget there eh, too. Education, you know, again, education is the universal services, you know, like for, for our young people, but supported by our community health and our social work services. And again, our, our travel for that, our travel will work around even something as specific as, as the promise. We need to be clear that what we're doing here is not putting structural barriers in between things that just now are quite well knitted together. It sometimes comes across as if, you know, like everything that comes up here in this, this bill we're, we're negative about. I think just, just now I need to say there's a number of things that we're actually quite positive about. You know, there are a number of things here in terms of independent advocacy, support for carers, Angela, you know, th there's a range of things there that can actually be positive, but they can be progressed without the disruption and structural reform. So it's not about saying, you know, that we think everything's perfect just now. It's not. Things need improvement and we need to work at improvement. But the structural reform is coming in and, as you say, causes a risk in terms of the local structural arrangements and as well as that, a risk to our time and capacity for improvement, you know, in terms of what we're doing. OK, we'll come to Eddie Fonna. I don't know if you're able to touch particularly on issues of child protection. Um, um, I, th I think Eddie's, Eddie's yeah. probably better qualified on that in terms of, okay. in terms of MAPA. I think we, we've got, um, you know, we've certainly got concerns around, you know, uh, the integration of children's services, and I think the promise is, is, is a really important aspect to that, um, because, you know, every local authority now is... is, is, is is working really hard to make sure that we implement the recommendations of the promise. But what, what the bill does is kind of create an uncertainty because we don't know where children's services are, are, are going to lie. And just and, and I know it's in the interest of time, but just just to add to, to Eddie's point there, you know, Cosler's the same. You know, we don't think that everything about this bill is wrong. It's just that structural change. But our officers are working really closely with the Scottish Government, actually, on, on things like Anne's Law, on the Charter, on the right to break for carers, because there are things in there that are good, you know, but unfortunately, you know, we can we do get distracted by, it and the attention is given to, you know, that kind of mass transfer of, of staff. So, um, but Eddie, I don't know if you in, you wanted to add on child protection. Did, did, bit of it. I, I, again, you know, within the the build and the, the policy memorandums, one of the things that seemed to be significantly missed was the role of the chief social work officer. You know, and the, the role that that takes overall in giving advice to a council and to other partners around social work and social care, you know, like issues. The role of myself now as chair of the chief officers group, you know, like in terms of taking that accountability for public protection, along with my colleagues in health and, and the police, you know, is because I have the levers to do things and change things. You know, I have that, you know, management responsibility to change things. What this would do would take away the levers for you to actually change things and, and support your chief social worker to do that. So, so there are concerns that this will interfere with well-established public protection arrangements. OK, and if I can come to, to Carol, you said in your response that a risk of fragmentation of local services. I wonder if um, you're able to expand on which specific areas the risk is greatest? I think probably Eddie is, is better placed to be able to say which services, but I think the general point is that, uh, as others have said, is that a lot of services are delivered, uh, are integrated. People work across the, the service lines in local government, and there are in joint initiatives that will need to be disaggregated. There, would, there are joint services that need to be disaggregated. Um, how will the National Care Service link in with housing <coughs> services, with education, employability, um, other services around youth work and addiction. Addiction has been mentioned, but mental health and leisure as well as the public protection um, services. So all of those councils get criticised for, or public sector gets criticised and councils get criticised for working in silos. But I think what we've seen at, at, over the years in local government is how they've broken down those silos. And there's, there are multi-services, multi-service teams that are working in particular areas. And, and, and that is where the risk is, I think, in terms of set, pulling that away, it creates a gap. So how are we going to fill that gap? And how are we going to ensure that those integrated services that are integrated around people and communities, that we don't lose that and end up with two separate institutions working um, not so closely at the local level. Okay. 
Thanks, Quina. Thanks, Mark. And um, we're going to come to the final two questions from M Marie McNair. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Uh, I'll, I'll direct my first question to Eddie from Solas. Um, what impact do you think, if any, the development of the National Care Service uh, could have on the so-called New Deal uh, between the Scottish Government and local government, as detailed in the recent programme uh, for government? I think, you know, the, just now the process we're going through towards the National Care Service is, you know, it makes challenging relationships, you know, because local governments see this as a diminution of, of their role there. So it's, it's making the relationships challenging there. That's not to say that we can't put that aside and work for improvement. So we're almost, you know, sitting in two different rooms at different times and actually, you know, like, trying to work towards improvement but also as local government feeling threatened eh, in terms of the National Care Service eh, in, in terms of, of that. So, so I, I do think that that's, you know, where we are there. I think there also needs to be, you know, as some of this develops on, because it's a framework bill, because there's uncertainties, that builds in lack of trust because you don't know your direction of travel. So, so I do think when we talk about, you know, the new deal of that, we have to actually see you know, like how can, how do we trust each other that what we're all doing? Because again, and we've said, you know, in, in the submissions, we absolutely believe that what ministers want and what local government want in terms of improvement in social care is, is no different. We actually think it's just outlined there's a range of things within it that are actually really positive. But the part about structural reform is that core part in the middle that we don't. And that's that's the part that, you know, does put tensions in the relationship. Thank you. MD else want to add anything further? No, I mean just to just to reinforce that. I think in terms of the you know the relationship at the moment is challenging in that area. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you've got a you know when you've got a bill that says we're going to take that, and you've heard the kind of instability and and and, and issues that 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 causes, that will make for a difficult relationship. But just you know around that area, you know. But as as Eddie said, there are all, even in the social care field, there are a whole series of conversations and joint working going on around improvement, uh, around all the, the stuff in the statement of intent about fair work and um, uh, re uh, non-residential charging. So that that's all going on. Um, but yeah, it, it, it casts a bit of a shadow. Let's, let, let's put it that way. Mm. Yeah. I'm certainly aware of that. It obviously been a previous council for 19 years, just um, stood down last year. Um, Eddie, I'll direct my next question, but in earlier responses to the questions, you've obviously you've spoken about the challenge uh, likely to arise from the transfer of the 75,000 uh, local authority staff, you know, obviously to the new care service. Is there anything further you'd like to add? Obviously, you've covered anything um, further you'd like, just for the benefit of the committee. No, I, 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 just that, that that's become a focus you know, of the discussions and the debate. Um, and and in that you know, and in that sense that's not helpful. But but actually this is about a workforce, you know, um, and it's and, and again the, the uncertainty around, you know, how that will happen, you know, um, and, and when it will happen and if it will happen and pensions and you know and pay and terms and conditions, all of that really just creates that uncertainty in a workforce who are already, you know, stretched um, in the context of, you know, uh, what we've been through in the last few years and what we're and what we're still going through. So, so, so our view, you know, the causal view is very much that we should that that we should take that away. That sh that shouldn't be happening. We should not do that. And then we work together to work, you know, to see what we can actually do here. You know, um, and and I know, you know, Eddie might have a view from a a, a chief executive perspective on the impact mm -hmm. of what that would mean for the for. For, for terms and conditions and pay and for his workforce, it's probably, I'll, if, if you're OK, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that to Eddie. I was going to go over to Minnie. Thanks, okay. thanks Eddie. I mean, earlier, you know, we spoke about a council may choose not to become, you know, involved in delivery of, of social care. As things stand, I would suggest they wouldn't be able, you know, to be involved in the delivery of, of social care. And that's because, as we currently understand it, local authority social care services would have to compete against the private and independent sector. Well, the terms and conditions of local authority social care workers are such that they get access to local government pension scheme, etc., which means local government on top of the paid costs are adding at least another 20% on top of that in what they in terms of pay in. So so the unit costs are significantly higher. And if you went out to you know the market to do that, you know, you simply couldn't, you know, compete. Now from my perspective when we talk about fair work, 
you know, the solution to that is to make sure there's enough resource in it so is that the people who work in the care homes, etc., in the independent sector also have access to, you know, like good pension schemes, etc. You know, in the third sector, the independent sector, that's what fair work would be about. So all social care workers, no matter which sector you worked in, actually had decent terms and conditions. At that stage, if you level it up, you, you, you can c compete if you want, you know, want to, to do that, but it's always taken us back to where we were many years ago in terms of compulsory competitive tendering, and you know, for local authorities or internal markets, you know, etc. Uh, where we then, but right now, unless our colleagues in the independent and third sector are able to get their terms and conditions up to equivalence of you know, local authority social care workers, which are just the same as every other local authority worker and you know, and health service colleagues in terms of the public sector, then quite frankly, we could not compete in terms of a financial basis of it. Um, Derek, you want to come in as well? I would just want to, to, to add, I'm conscious, conscious of time, it's, don't underestimate the scale of the challenge of transferring that number of employees. Cost in terms of, the, to me, there's a hidden cost in there, which again, I don't think is reflected in the financial memorandum, because ultimately you have to standardised terms and conditions, and that pushes the underlying cost up. So I think I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that, but just, just a warning that, that there are additional costs that I don't think are reflected, and just the logistical challenge of doing Thank that. you. Take that on board. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Marie. And that concludes all our, our questions, and I just want to say thank you all for coming today to speak with us and share your really important uh, evidence um, and responding to our questions. Uh, I now suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a change of witnesses.
So what time should we stop? We'll now begin our second panel of witnesses this morning with a focus on local authorities. And we're joined on, online by Douglas Henry, who's the Executive De Director from Argyll and Butte Council. Welcome. And also in the room with Eddie Fraser, who is the Chief Executive of East Ayrshire Council. Michelle McGinty, who is the Head of Corporate Policy and Governance at Glasgow City Council. Paula McClay, who's the Head of Policy and Insight at Edinburgh City Council, and Dr. Don Roberts, who's the Chief Executive at Dumfries and Galloway Council. Welcome. And um, I'd like to begin questions. Um, um, I would be interested to hear if panel members agree with the Feely Review that the COVID pandemic demonstrated clearly that the Scottish public expect national accountability for adult social care support and to look to Scottish ministers to provide that accountability. And I don't know who would, I'm going to just open that one up to everybody. So anyone want to pick that up first? Eddie. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think, you know, it is clear that, that the public look to, to ministers in terms of accountability, but accountability for, I think, setting standards uh, and, you know, like, uh, assurance uh, that that's, you know, that framework of how social care services are going to be delivered uh, ac across the country. You know, I think they would expect, you know, like ministers to make sure that there was programmes of improvement, where programmes of improvement w were required. But I also think, you know, the public uh, are used to local accountability and that they have access to, you know, accountability for, for local services through the local council and through the local uh, health board. Uh, in terms of, there is a place, you know, like for a national care service in terms of setting an overall framework of standards uh, and assurance. But then there's also definitely the place on, on a local basis for people with local knowledge about the, how you actually deliver against those standards. Thanks for that, um, Dr. Don Roberts. Thank you. Um, in terms of accountability, I think we saw through the, the pandemic the real benefit of local partners working together and the ability to flex and adapt to what the local situation was. And so there's real value in that local accountability, local democracy, the engagement of local members um, from their knowledge of um, local areas, the communities that they serve. But I, I concur um, with, with Eddie's point about the role of a national body in relation to um, overall standards, accountability, um, in terms of being able to hold aspects of the system um, to account and support and enable improvement and delivery in local areas. Because there are, there's no doubt that there are some of the challenges that we all face in local government, and it's certainly the case in my council, um, that are common. Um, common challenges across um, local authorities. And I think the role of a, a national body in supporting improvement, enabling improvement, and enabling some of those challenges to be met in a different way, um, I think is, is definitely um, of value. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Paula. Um, I think ministers in terms of ministerial accountability in terms of crisis moments is perhaps a natural reaction, but I don't think that implies an ongoing day-to-day -day, um, aspiration for government accountability for all that social care does every day for ongoing years to come. So I think that might be a leap too far for me. Um, I, I think that we need to value really the connections that councillors have with their communities, as has just been said, the local knowledge they have, and that when issues arise with the service, that ability to go to somebody who understands you, your place, and, and the service providers is really critical. Um, and to be able to find that accountability on your doorstep with the day-to-day -day provision that you're receiving is is the way in which we would we would see the future um, panning out. As I say, 
you know, in times of crisis, it's natural. The government has a role to play. They have a role to play, an ongoing role to play in supporting local authorities to continue to improve and address shared challenges. But that, that doesn't circumvent or need to replace local accountability. Thank you. Michelle. Um, yes, I would, I would support my colleagues' comments on those. And, and also, um, I think in terms of to develop a bit further the pandemic situation, um, a lot of what happened during the pa pandemic to support our most vulnerable communities was organic and local. Um, and the value of that has been absolutely enormous. And we've learned a lot about service delivery as a result of that. And so have started to change some of the ways we deliver to our, our most vulnerable um, communities as a result. So we are making some structural change um, as a lesson learned from the way that, that, that support grew in our communities. And to reiterate the point, I absolutely accept that, that ministers have a role and a support role to play in particularly in regulation and standards, supporting us in national pressures around um, recruitment, retention, procurement, all of these where, where there can be a real added value. But if you were to ask a member of the public in Glasgow where they go to expect their service to be delivered, it'd be their local councillor. Thanks very much for that. And uh, Douglas Hendry, would you like to come in on that? Thank you. Just uh, to agree with the comments made by colleagues, yes, uh, there certainly would be, in my view, uh, an expectation on the part of uh, our communities um, that things do change and there is uh, different accountability, greater, as, as, as you choose, on the part of ministers. But I also suggest very strongly that uh, there is also an expectation that there is local accountability when it comes to uh -oh. communities. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to hear from, again, I think this is going to be for everyone, and, and there'll be questions coming that maybe focus um, uh, in specific areas, but um, I'd be interested to hear how much individual councils currently spend on social care and how this has changed over the past decade, and um, if there have been changes in outcomes for community and service users as a result of increased or degree decreased spending. Anyone want to pick that up first? Okay, Eddie. So, generally, again, generally, in East Ayrshire, we've seen a significant change uh, in, in how we spend uh, money in, in social care over, you know, the years. So, what we've seen is generally um, a reduction in the number of people who are actually in care homes, and an increase in the number of people who are actually supported in, in care at home. Uh, this is not a, a short term. You know, fixed. You know, we took decisions as far back as 2005. That, as a council, we would come out the care home market and we would focus our support in terms of care at home, and you know, work in partnership with the independent sector who deliver all our, our care home services in, in East Ayrshire. So these were long-term, you know, strategies in terms of what we've done, and we have actually seen a significant change in terms of the number of people who are in care homes as opposed to the number of people supported in, in care at home eh, in terms of, of doing that in a positive you know, like way of doing that. So, so we, we do see that, you know, again, over the, the period as well, you know, we've seen a significant change in the number of people with complex needs and how they're supported. So we've seen them move through a range of things. You know, some people come out of institutions and they were supported on a one-to-one -one basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That didn't suit some people. People found that quite intense in terms of how that is. So again, evolving models in terms of how that is, working in partnership with housing about how we do that and we support people eh, in terms of doing that. So they still get that independence, but they're supported in a slightly different way in terms of being supported in, in housing eh, models too. Right through you know, to how we support eh, our young people in the care system, so obviously we now, you know, support our young people in the care system right up to 26, if they so wish. You know, I do go back to, and it's, I don't think it's proud days looking back, you know, in terms of some of the social work and social care services when young people were in the care system and some of them left as early as 16. 
you know, and that they were on their own, and that's that's changed, you know, like now in terms of where we are. So, uh, the, the spend in terms of you know like how social work and social care is, is has changed significantly, and it has changed to very much, you know, the the community models eh, of of delivering social work and social care to positive outcomes for the majority of people. Painting that picture of what's going on in East Ayrshire, uh, Don, would you like to come in? Thank you. Yes, and um, a similar picture for Dumfries and Galloway, and um, the in terms of the the current budget position, um, just under 100 million um, is um, currently delegated to the Health and Social Care Partnership, and we retain um, about another 28 million for care services that we. Um, deliver that are not delegated and that's about 30 percent of the overall budget but what I think we need to take into account also is the the cost of support services um, in terms of legal services HR services ICT services property and asset services um, so they're the more direct cost but there is a broader cost um, associated with um, the support um, that those services, those other services provide, and over time, um, a similar pattern um, to, to that's, that that's been described for East Ayrshire in terms of um, increase in care at home, decrease in um, residential care. We've seen um, changing needs, an increase in more complex needs that need to be um, supported. And we've seen greater integration um, within um, the local authority services with services such as homelessness, housing, um, leisure, uh, financial well-being, and those broader services that support people to be independent, healthy and well um, as, as they move through their years. And that, that greater kind of synergy and integration with those broader services and the development of more community-based models has, has been the direction of travel and is something that we would want to see progress further as we move forward. There was a lot of learning from the pandemic in terms of more that, that we can do and certainly um, a focus um, in terms of how we, how we continue to address need in the longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle? Yeah, um, so... I guess a different model in Glasgow um, with some of the same emphasis on, on both policy change and the and de change in demand. Um, around uh, half a billion of the council's budget is, is um, delegated to the HSCP services. Um, since we have around 12,000 um, staff in that HSCP, um, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been 100 million investment in new um, care homes, five to replace 16 and six new day care centres. So a different approach um, in terms of providing facilities, but also um, a big emphasis now, particularly since the, the formation of the HSCP on maximising independence um, and for our most vulnerable. Um, we have directly provided day home residential care and also through contracted health um, and social care providers. Um, we also have a slightly different model um, in our HSCP that some services are delivered at a health board level, so sexual services, for example. Um, so it's quite a different picture from some other parts of the country. Um, the demand increases and the budgets decrease, um, although ring-fenced and, 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 and protected, um, there is, of course, um, a lot of demand. Um, we're seeing at the moment an increase in demand of around 5 to 6%, uh, and along with the inflationary pressures, that's obviously um, quite a significant pressure. Um, we're also, as, as everybody is, seeing an older population and, and a... Um, a real emphasis to need to change um, for the long term to deal with those different needs. Thank you. And Paula? Yeah, just to say, in, in Edinburgh, 40% um, of the Council's budget uh, is uh, spent on uh, social care services and 22% of our, our workforce, we, we project as well, year on year 6% uh, increase in demand. But, uh, you know, as has been said by the panel, um, we you know, see uh, actual demand outstrip that. We see demographic pressures in the capital city and where we have invested in improvements, um, sometimes they are challenged by moments in time like 
COVID, like Brexit, like Ukraine, that, that, that bring additional challenges to our systems. What we are now seeing is increased complexity of need that, that is very challenging to respond to. But I think, you know, outcomes, yes, they are linked to money, but, but local authorities are also working extremely hard to remove silos between services and bring and integrate teams and um, make sure that we're taking as preventative approaches as we can. And it's in that um, landscape of activity that is embedded throughout so homelessness, family, household support, poverty prevention. It is in those integrated teams that we're also trying to improve outcomes and prevent people from um, manifesting as need within the system. So I think there's a lot that, that Edinburgh is doing in that space through the IGB and through the Council um, to improve things, but it, it's, it's a mixed picture uh, also because of the context that we're living through at the moment. Thanks very much. And uh, Douglas, do you, would you like to come in on that? Thank you. Just broadly similar, the picture <clears throat> in Argyle and Butte again. Uh, social work in the round he has been a, for uh, many years and continues to be the second largest area of council spend after education. Uh, in our terms, then, um, the nature of our the engagement with the IJB and the HSCP is that all social work functions are covered, the adult, children and families, justice, and we're in a similar ballpark eh, to colleagues in terms of the proportion of the total spend of the council that social work accounts for. In terms of particular priorities, then there are uh, national trends the, that we recognise in the same way as everyone else does, to move away from residential or institutional care, the rise of more and more complex cases, and the need to address the uh, significant numbers of these complex cases, particularly when they relate to young people uh, on a non-silo basis, if I can put it like that, on a joined-up basis. So it's across all of social work, also involving education, housing, the other kind of players in there. Um, it is probably also fair to say that um, in the contact context of a rural and islands, the authority like Argyll and Butte, where over 40% of our population live in a, a really remote and rural areas, that there are particular challenges about delivering services uh, to people who are distanced from main centres of population and therefore access to the same volume and variety of services uh, that other people can get to um, within the locale, if I can put it like that. Thank you. Thanks very much for that and, and thank you so much for bringing in the rural island um, perspective there and those challenges. I'm now going to move on to questions from Willie Coffey. Thanks again, convener. Thank you. Um, just waiting on the mic. Yep. Um, Eddie, you spoke at length uh, in the first panel there about how well you felt the integrated joint board arrangements were working in, in East Ayrshire. Um, is, is it fair to say that, that that isn't consistent across Scotland? And I wanted to explore with the panel why you think that is, and how do you think we get that consistency of provision unless we have a national approach to it? that's perhaps outlined in the proposals in the bill? I think what we'll hear from colleagues is that, depending on local circumstances, we work towards you know, the positive outcomes for our local communities, but how that's, that's delivered may be, be different in terms of uh, uh, local uh, communities. Uh, I was speaking to, to a colleague who formerly you know, worked with Douglas in Argyle and Butte, and there, you know, their IJB had all services like East Ayrshire has, as, you know, children, adults, justice, etc. But moving to a larger authority where the structure is different, you know, then that wasn't the right thing to do. 
And actually, there's a reflection that you know you can reach the same outcomes, but do things in, in a different you know like way uh, in terms of of that. So, in terms of the delivery of you know like the IGIBs and the scope of of the IGIBs, as you know, you know each local area will have went through real consideration of how things worked previously and then how you take things uh, through uh, into that. And that can work in a way that, you know, then facilitates, you know, like joint working uh, across joint commission and internal commission and, you know, like across in terms of how we, we, we deliver things, you know, for positive uh, outcomes. The core part of me is it will depend on local circumstances. So in East Ayrshire, I spoke before about how we have vibrant communities, that's our community engagement you're in. If other areas don't have that, they might do things differently and they might have, you know, their community services within the partnership. You know, financial inclusion teams, you know, that work within the partnership in East Ayrshire and other areas they don't, they actually work as core council, you know, like services. Actually, it goes back to, you know, at like that point about integration of health and social care is about integration for the perspective of the person that uses the services. How a local system actually knits that together to deliver it has to take into account all the local you know circumstances you know about whether there's been decisions about what you deliver directly or what you commission you know whether there's decisions about rurality you know or, or urban there are a whole range of different factors that people will play play into to that but i do go back to you know that that's where i think there is a role on a national basis for ministers to set down almost here here's the standards you know, here's the outcomes that we are looking for here. We want to hear from you how you're going to deliver against, you know, like these standards, you know, and the, the local system then take into account how they design that local system to the local standards, that the overarching framework that's been set at a national level. Eddie? Mother. Well, thanks for that response. And, uh, I'm just concerned about time, and we've got quite a few questions to go through. So what I would like to ask is just going forward, to uh, you know, build on if there's something that's not been said, or if your council runs differently, which I'm sure we're going to hear now. Um, but just uh, otherwise, we won't get through the questions in the time that we've got allocated. But I think Michelle, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, in specific uh, for Glasgow, every, everywhere has their their complex needs, not least um, Glasgow. I think it's fair to say that we believe through you know through our performance frameworks that the HSCP is working extremely well. Um, we would absolutely support um, a standards and inspection um, regime at a national level uh, in terms of support. I think it's fair to expect uh, um, HSCPs to be variable. They're young. This system is, is still bedding in. There's been a pandemic through, through some of it. Um, so that national oversight would be welcome. Um, that's different to national delivery. Um, to give a specific example... Um, why commissioning and staffing, in our view, must be kept at local level is, is the different needs of the different areas. So, for example, homelessness is in our um, HSCP, uh, just as an example. To unknit that from, from everything else that's in the HSCP would be extremely disrupt disruptive and, and damaging to the service, <coughs> just by way of an example. Thanks. Don. Thank you. And um, Dumfries and Galloway is a, a different model um, to East Ayrshire, uh, just for your awareness. Um, adult social care um, is part of the integration arrangements. Justice and uh, children's social work remains with the, the council. And as, as has been said, that was that decision was based on, you know, careful consideration of the local system, the local arrangements and what would work for Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and um, the IJB, you know, works in a way that obviously um, reflects the local arrangements, local demand, local pressures, local delivery models, the strengths in the system, what we can build on, and, you know, the, the extent of collaboration and the opportunities that exist. And I just want to, to make the point as well, um, you know, seven years um, in existence, but we have had, you know, um, two years of a... Um, COVID pandemic and a year of um, since the, the majority of that a year of um, you know cost of living and that continues so I think you know the IJBs haven't yet had the opportunity to fully 
demonstrate um, their worth and value um, and in all places. And I think, um, you know, but the, the building blocks are there and the, the, the confidence is there, certainly in our IJB, to, to move forward um, positively um, in terms of delivery of local outcomes. Thanks very much. And uh, Douglas, I'm just going to keep calling you in because I can imagine it's hard to come in when you're the only person online. So do you want to come yeah. in now? Thank you. Just briefly, um, and going back to the comments that Eddie made in the first set under this um, particular question or point, then I think it's uh, probably fair to say that there isn't a single clear articulation of a, what consistency of social care, social work services uh, would be across the country. Back to the basic point, I have to recognise that local solutions are needed uh, to local situations. And again, um, in the Argyll and Con Butte context, where we've got communities from urban to rural to island, uh, it is a necessity to deliver services that are, to an extent, bespoke, eh, that fit the particular needs of the communities and what we want. So I think um, that's a point that I, I would want to kind of press. Thanks very much. And Paula? We've got similar arrangements to Dumfries and Galloway, so I won't, I won't go over that. Um, I think, for us, there's a difference in consistency of outcome, which we absolutely would be committed to. Um, assistant, uh, consistency in evaluating outcomes so that we know what we're working towards. But I think that's very different from requiring consistency in inputs. And, you know, when you look at personalisation, understanding people's needs, understanding different local contexts than that would be in Edinburgh to an, an island's authority, for example, you can expect to see those inputs be designed very differently and appropriately so. Um, the councils themselves, you know, rightly or wrongly, over time are structured differently, and how we work across services will be different, uh, and therefore the inputs will be bespoke. Um, so I think the overall ambition for consistent outcomes isn't one we disagree with. It's the, con the, the desire to have some consistent mechanism for delivery, that there's, there's some paint-by-numbers approach to this that isn't. Um, we, we have to design services that, that meet both people's needs and the unique nature of, of our lo local areas. The other thing I would say is we're all facing similar challenges, but perhaps in different scales. So we have recruitment challenges, all of us. We all have um, issues in terms of complexity of need and responding to that. Um, we have challenges with the markets, the local market mix that we have. I think for Edinburgh, when, when all of that comes together, it's the scale of it that really challenges us. And, and again, we'd be happy to work um, with all partners in, in how we might resolve the scale of those challenges locally um, and continue on an improvement journey to meet the outcomes that we all desire. Thanks very much. That's probably enough from then, okay. just to get another colleagues in, convener. Yep. That's Great. fine for me. Thank Thanks, you. Willie. Um, I'm now going to move to questions from Marie McNair. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Welcome back, Eddie. Um, I'll put my first question to, to Eddie. Um, to what extent uh, are councillors uh, currently accountable for the social care services provided in that area? I served in IGB as a councillor, and it had me and uh, two other councillors on it for the benefit of other uh, members of the committee. What role uh, do the rest of the councillors, the majority, have a role in de uh, determining how care services are delivered? And what evidence is there that social care provision is considered at local elections? And how have you involved service users and carers in reaching that view? So, I mean, first of all, you know, I think, you know, over and above the, the small number of elected members who are on IGIBs, mm -hmm. uh, who in, in our instance tend to be the most senior councillors, you know, within the council actually sit on IGIBs, they, they very much own what we call our social care services. You know, so the, the council still sees social care services as that local service that is delivered in every single local community in, in East Ayrshire. And our councillors will still come, all 32 of them, 
uh, will advocate in terms of social care you know, for local communities with the, the IGIB. And given that, the, you know, the Director of Health and Social Care as an employee of the Council, they're perfectly entitled you know, to, to, to do that uh, in, in terms of, of doing that. In terms of formal reporting arrangements, it's built into integration schemes about how often you know, um, IGIBs have to report back. But in essence, they actually do it for us a lot more than that. So we do it, you know, in relation to all our papers around alcohol and drugs, you know, that although is led within the IGIB clearly has an interest right across, you know, the, the whole of the council, that they, they do it in terms of looked after uh, ch children, you know, care experienced children. So again, you know, as members of the IGIB that who are not, you know, sorry, members of the council who are not on the IGIB, but lead on children's services, and therefore they have, you know, an input to that. So the, the IGIB and the social care services are not just managed within that, that unit there, it's managed, you know, all across, you know, the, 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 the services in, in terms of what we do. In terms of engaging, you know, our local communities, I suppose the most uh, recent you know, an like example of that would be, you know, our IGIB, along with the council, but this one time specifically the IGIB, is out doing participatory budget. So it's out, you know, with our local communities, we a quarter of a million pounds, basically get into local areas and saying, what way do you want to spend that? And the decisions about how to spend that resource are actually, it's the IGIB resource, are actually made by the, the local, you know, communities. When we sit down with our, our children's services, you know, our care experience services that we're talking about, our pizza and coke nights, as we call them, you're sitting down and you're actually talking to them. So the work around the promise and that, et cetera, very much, you know, in, engages uh, people. So it's been, for us, you know, constant, you know, engagement, you know, with, you know, local communities uh, in, in doing, you know, that. So, so I hope that's, that's answered for that. Anybody else like to follow? Yeah, I can cover off. In terms of... Uh, um, formal reporting. Our IGB reports regularly to the Policy and Sustainability Committee, but also to our Government Risk and Best Value Committee. So there are opportunities to transparently hold to account the work and, and, and um, engage with the work of the IGB and the decisions that they independently take. Um, I think, you know, the Council remains responsible for the staff we employ who are delivering the services and deliver the duties that we still we still hold. So there's definitely a legitimate relationship um, for councillors in relation to integration still, um, without in any way uh, circumventing the, the uh, arrangements for the IJB to take the decisions it is delegated to take by law. In terms of engaging, we do annual surveys with our care home residents. We do, um, you know, community-based teams day-to-day -day engagement. It's not something that happens once. You know, this is about working closely with communities, um, particularly around any key service design proposals, as we're required to do by our policies. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll just move, move on to my next question, and I'll pop that to Michelle. Does the Bill's financial memorandum adequately explore the potential financial impact? for Council, and if not, what would Councils expect to see as a, at this point in terms of financial assessments? In terms of, generally speaking, around the, the financial memorandum, I think it's it's been widely discussed at different committees and also in the previous panel that, that there is a, a an envelope that lacks detail, um, that there are pressures that aren't included in it, um, and that we would want to see much more work um, take place on the detail. One of the, one of the major issues for us is the lack of a business case at this stage to, to, to partner with a financial memorandum. So a structural change of this, um, of this proportion in the council, we would, we would be doing feasibility study, risk, financial um, gaps, all, all, of, all of the things that you have to consider before you change something on this scale. We don't have any of that, and therefore, and also a financial memorandum that's lacking in detail. So, it, it's it's almost impossible to give you a good answer in the sense that there's there's detail missing that we can't respond to. Um, so, a lot more work to be done. Do other panel pa panel members share that view, or do, you, do you want anyone want to come in there on it? Nope. I abs absolutely share the view. Um, I don't know how we can accurately assess the financial memorandum with the. The bill as high level as it currently is and the absence of detail within it. 
um, and that's very worrying. The only point I would add is the, the financial memorandum, and indeed the de debate around this fails to really understand that this isn't just reforming social care, it is reforming local government. And we, we are not looking at the wider financial implications and operational and systemic implications for local government and giving that the level of consideration that a reform of, that, of this scale really does deserve. Thank you. Um, just my final question. Um, what impacts will be in local, th uh, local authorities should a third of their budget um, be transferred to the new uh, National Care uh, Bill, uh, National Care Service Bill? Uh, pop that to Michelle again, and then just whoever else wants to come in. I, I think we've talked a lot about the integration of delivery of service. So every, uh, I was, in your previous question, I was writing down a list of the different parts of the council. In fact, mm -hmm. it's all of it. Yep. So the impact... It, in terms of, of detriment in other parts of the council is, is significant. So how do we, do, apart from the, the fundamental issue of, of the transfer of staff, which you've heard from other panelists is extremely complex, um, what that then does is leave behind a structure that's been knitted in to the HSCP for good reason, for good policy reason and for good um, um, integration reasons. And so all back office, all um, other services, whether that be education, housing, Glasgow Life, city building, all of them have got an, an input. And therefore, where does the, where are the boundaries? Because they are so blurred, the, the impact is, is, as Paula has said, effectively the, the reorganisation of the council and its budget. Anyone else want to come in, Eddie? So, so for me, you know, in the current nature of, of where we are, there's almost there's a risk, you know, like whether we go, you know, like the, the model of everything goes into the, you know, like the, the new arrangements or it doesn't. And then actually one of the biggest risks is that this interim period where we actually don't know what we're planning for. So in terms of the, the partnerships where they have children's services, justice services, adult, older people services, addiction services all in, if we go to, and you know, there was suggested, you know, an incremental move across to, you know, like, you know, like the new boards. Quite frankly, what am I going to do with my justice services? My justice services and my arrangements are fully integrated within our current things. My children's services are like that. I would need to go away and totally redesign the council to actually change the council. So, so for some people, the proposed change is about putting things in would be a massive reorganisation. For others actually saying we'll do it incrementally will be a massive, you know, reorganisation. So there is no do nothing, you know, like, um, you know, option here other than trust that local systems know how to design the system for the better outcomes, you know, look like for that there. So it's not just that I say about the money and that the actual structure of councils just now, either the ones that have services in or the ones that don't, there's going to be a big lump of councils are going to have to totally restructure the councils. Absolutely. Douglas, do you want to come in? Just uh, mindful that I've not brought you in. Thank you. Um, again, uh, hearing a lot um, from what colleagues have said that would apply in our case too. Uh, I think uh, I couldn't. I wouldn't, don't think it's possible to overemphasize uh, the issues um, that councils have to face, particularly as we're rolling forward in the current scenario where. As Eddie has just highlighted, it would mean for us partial disaggregation. Uh, and that's um, not only of the frontline, say, adult services, but also of the parts of the rest of the council that support that uh, adult services. And then potentially um, a period of time down the road, further disaggregation in the event that the remainder of social care, social work was to roll over. It seems to me that that, from a council perspective, is basically counterproductive and inefficient in that, um, you know, partial disaggregation, things begin to run, then more coming out. Um, that, these comments shouldn't be taken as a, a view that it can't be done. It can be done. But it strikes me as not necessarily effective uh, or the solution or the one that will deliver best outcomes for our people in our communities. Thank you. 
No further questions. Give it up. Don, you oh, want to sorry, come in. <laughs> Just um, going to make um, the point around lack of clarity on um, you know issues to do with children's services and justice, and obviously they sit outside for us the IJB arrangements. So it does bring in um, significant concern about what that will mean for the local authority when some of our delegated functions would be transferring, um, but also functions that sit firmly within the, the council, but also the support services and what it means to disentangle from some of the services where we, um, you know, where we uh, work really closely together. And the, the real risk here in all of this is, you know, that we see a reduction in performance and outcome. Um, because of disruption, um, but also remember that um, these are the most vulnerable within our society. And these are the most vulnerable who we need to put right at the centre of any change and making sure that, you know, um, you know, the change is, is taken forward for the right reasons and it, it should be around outcomes rather than an assumption of, of change, you know, um, per se, and delivering structural change as being the answer. So I, I'm, I'm really concerned, my council's really concerned about the workforce implications. And that's right across the board, you know, for um, those services that are within the integrated um, arrangements now, those services that um, our care services, social work services within the council and the services that are, are not part of that but do provide support and the disruption that that will cause um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Marie. And we're going to move to questions from Mark Griffin. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. I wanted to continue with a, a kind of similar line of question as I had in the, the previous panel, just about the, the impact on the remainder of services. But I think a lot of the panel have, have kind of covered that and just wanted to maybe ask a different question rather than talk about the impact on the services that remain, just to talk about the impact on local government in its entirety. You know, we've had police and fire nas um, nationalisation um, we now are looking at social work, social care. We've got educational, regional collaboratives. Chat about national education service. You know, is this a return to district councils by stealth? Is this an appropriate way to look at a, a whole change of the landscape of local government by piecemeal, um, or should we be looking at a wider uh, look at local government rather than, it, than doing it this way? It feels like, I wouldn't use the word stealth, I'd use the word um, that we are in effect reforming local government by default rather than by design. And I think that that, that is not the most advantageous way to talk about the role of local government and councils in delivering services to our communities. Um, and there is certainly space to have that discussion. But to, I suppose, be um, taking elements of roles and, and responsibilities and budgets periodically over time, you know, without paying attention to what that means for local government and, and, and the role of councillors, the, the role of local democracy in and of itself feels um, inappropriate, that we should give that. The, the due regard that, that it should have um, and consider it in its own right. This this bill isn't just about social care, it's about the future of local government also. Yeah. I, I suppose that, you know, I, I would agree with that and, you know, speaking to local elected members about, so, so why do you stand for council? What is it you actually want to influence? You know, and if people want to stand for council to influence the local services, the social care services, and you know, the, possibly the education services, and that you know, already police and fire, to, you know, are, are away. If, if you're not going to do that, you know, what is the attraction in terms of what you're going to stand for? You know, like, how do we make sure that local democracy has an influence over the local community? Thinking, you know, of Christie on a local level, you know, how do we make sure it does that? And if you take, the, you know, the accountability away, as this is an example of it, then then 
what is the motivation for you know for local government? What's the influence of that local councillor? I think it's a good question. Did you? No. All right. I support those comments. Thank you. Um, just want to check, Douglas. Do you need to come in on that at all? I think the basics from a council perspective have been covered. Um, I think there is the perhaps again lack of clarity in overall terms and some of this is probably at a national level about uh, the role of elected members certainly in relation to NCS but maybe even on a wider basis that there is a drive to engage in a more uh, on a wider basis about a wider range of issues uh, local authorities to do that with communities, with local groups, so on. And there is a question, I believe, in there about the role of the elected member as a local representative of their community. These two things don't necessarily sit comfortably together. So apologies, I know that's gone off on a slight um, tangent, but um, I think it is part of the wider picture. Thank you. No need to apologise. It's always good to uncover other perspectives. Mark, I think you've got another question. Uh, ju just another question. Going, going back to the, the, the impact on individual services, and I think I've heard from the panel here in person, but I wonder if I can cut, come to Douglas, if you're able to set out a perspective of, you know, particularly in a, a rural and an island authority, what the, the impact will be on the services um, left over if we go forward to the National Care Service? What will the impact on housing, education, uh, leisure in your particular authority? Um, maybe come at that from a couple of different uh, angles. First is, um, it seems to me there is an argument that the social care, social work, um, with other elements of the local authority education, housing, kind of whole range of other services uh, do work better uh, under that umbrella. That is not to say he wouldn't still be joined up working under a different arrangement he, with uh, an NCS, but it does seem to me that the existing umbrella overall kind of framework uh, within which social care is currently delivered uh, does that's at one level. At a different level than others have touched on uh, what it means for the remainder of the local authority. Uh, uh, we have begun the in our Gailin Butte to look at uh, that and um, I just maybe emphasise comments that others have made. Um, the work that we've done thus far indicates that the impact on other services, some definite, some potential, definite in, things, in terms of things like legal support, HR, uh, for example, in Argyll and Butte, we've got a fully a joined up uh, HR service a, between council and IGB, um, uh, that definitely needs to be unpicked and there would then be a requirement to allocate people to separate parts of the post unpicking, if you like. Um, but it's wider than that. There are things like um, we do still have care homes, we have other social work facilities in Argyll and Butte. Um, as things stand, the estates, ground maintenance, things like that are carried out uh, by another part of the council. There's no guarantee that that would continue after unpicking. And it rolls them to the other corporate stuff like uh, finance. The, the finance team, again, is integrated. Um, taking uh, a look uh, forward, then, if we do move to the situation where uh, there is a disaggregation, then I believe that then brings challenges for all councils in terms of um, redesigning what's left 
to support what's left, if that makes sense. Um, I do not necessarily believe that that would mean the end of local government as it's currently known. Um, I think that's a, um, a particularly gloomy way forward, but certainly significant impacts on the whole of the Council uh, in terms of service delivery and also, as others have said earlier in this session, and I believe in the first one, a on council finances in general, um, impacts in capital spend, stuff like that. So that's a kind of um, whistle stop to the uh, around what I think are some of the main factors uh, that would be at play uh, 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 as we're talking about. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, um, Douglas. Just while while you, I'm just going to pick up uh, while you're still there. Um, do you have a view on whether the islands, uh, island communities impact assessment, which accompanies the bill, meets the requirement of the 2018 Islands Act? Yeah, um, we thought that there were a number of areas where the view could be taken that the, the impact assessment has uh, flaws. It's possible to take the view that uh, it hasn't been carried out uh, at the appropriate stage of the process. And if you have, um, again, a particular regard to the circumstances of areas like Argyll and Butte, if you look at it in its terms, it is pretty high level, and it's possible to take a view that it didn't uh, adequately address uh, the, the, the position of authorities such as a Gail and Butte. Um, it's something uh, that uh, ultimately is a matter for uh, ministers, uh, I believe, to determine, and if they are content with it, then fine. But it is possible to take a view that there are shortcomings in the process, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we're now going to move to questions from Paul McClellan. Yeah, thank, you. You know, thank you, panel. Um, can you touch on this before? It was talking about your understanding if um, children's services will be removed, transferred to the new uh, care service uh, as well. And I just wanted to try and take two questions at once. It was also mentioned in the last panel around about uh, reluctance from councils to invest in new and existing assets, if that happened, not just with the children's services, but broader. Um, so the first one is on national care, uh, on uh, children's services. Second one, more on the investment side of things. Would that impact on your council's own ability or appetite at this stage? And Eddie, I'll probably come to yourself on that. I know you touched on that in the last panel. Yeah. So I suppose in our, our response from from East Ayrshire, you know, we've said that we took the decisions uh, back, and it was 2014. We took the decisions to put our children's services, our justice services, etc., within the IGIB. But we put very clearly that was within the context of local accountability. That was within the context of local integrated children's services. So there's a strategic children's services board who is chaired the, the chief the chief officer also chaired that the education and everyone you know within that. So it was the right place to go because it kept the social work you know like profession together in terms of how we done that and they cross cutting things between justice, children, addiction and, and adults, you know, like they were there. So so we did that there. If at this stage someone's going to come back and say to us you know, like, would you do that? But the control of your children's services were going to be separated from your universal children's services in terms of your early years and your education service. I would need to take, take a lot of convincing, and I think the actual work that's going on just now would actually need to, you know, do some of that in terms of saying what would be the impact eh, of that in terms of, of, of transferring over. So, so this is a changed position for where we were back in 2014, where, yes, we were putting in arrangements, but we were putting in arrangements within local accountability, local structures. And I think that would need reconsideration. I think every council would like, we want to take reconsideration about you know, where that was eh, at that time. In terms of any investment in, in capital, you know, like just now, I think it'd likely be fair to say that likely every council chief executive uh, is sitting down with their elected members and looking at their capital programme just now and seeing whether it's affordable just now, you know, without even looking at, you know, given the, the financial circumstances uh, that, that we find ourselves in. 
But again, we're in uncertainty. So the uncertainty is that if the council, you know, takes a loan to build something in capital, are we assured that if there's a transfer of asset, that resource is going to come back to us? So, and if it's not, you know, like given the time scales, you would almost feel incompetent to go out there and spend significant amounts of council money that you knew there was a likelihood was going to be transferred away and the rest of the council was going to be left with the debt charge for that for the next 40 years. So it's not about a reluctance to invest in you know, social work, social care services, wellbeing services. It's about the competence of doing that in an already tight fiscal position and actually you know, feeling you may be left you know, with that debt for the rest of the council going forward. So I think that's the position most people would say they were in. Thanks for that, Paul. I've seen you nodding away there. I don't know if you want to add to that. He said it all, didn't he? Um, uh, yeah, it's about risk management and best value. How It's not a lack of desire to support and make the right investment decisions for the service and for the outcomes and for the people. It is how we do that legitimately to manage the wider risk to the council and with best value in mind to our communities. And, you know, at the moment, with the amount of, you know, lack of detail around this, we can't make those decisions really well with, with, with no information about what happens to the debt, the risk that we would carry. Anybody else wants to come in? Michelle? Yeah, just to... Uh, uh absolutely endorse everything that's been said. Also, just two additional points. There is a fundamental thing here about assets that have been invested in by communities through their council tax. Mm -hmm. And you, you, not only are we talking about best value and, and, and the practicalities of investment, but that you're breaking that link, and that's a fundamental um, change in position. Um, also, because of the integrated way that we deliver through community planning, through the, through the HSCP, a lot of our assets are shared with partners. So where does that, where's the consideration of that disaggregation? And again, without a business case, we, we, we just can't answer those questions. Good points. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just um, to, to support colleagues' comments, um, I think there's a general point here I would make around, you know, whether it's about decision-making in relation to investment in assets, or whether it's about even giving a view on aspects of the bill, you know, there's the whole principle around, you know, informed decision-making and being able to give an informed view and, you know, to have full understanding, to give full consideration to matters. And, you know, what's, what's underpinning, um, you know, a lot of our comments in our response is the lack of detail and the uncertainty that that creates and the concerns that, that we have, and I know is shared by, by others, about the reliance on secondary legislation to take through some of the very important, critical aspects of, of this overarching bill that will have fundamental implications for local government. And so with a backdrop of, of lack of clarity and lack of information, it's very difficult you know, for a council to make decisions in relation to investment and allocation of resource. In the meantime, it's very difficult for us to, you know, to give very concrete answers on aspects of, of what this bill is about and the concern about the reliance on secondary legislation um, means that you know, the level of engagement and scrutiny that will be available to councils in that process you know, brings you know, cause for concern. No? Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. We're now going to move on to our final questions from Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you uh, for joining us um, this morning. Um, I was specifically concerned looking at the submissions as an Edinburgh MSP anyway, um, at Edinburgh City Council's submission around fears that in the short to medium term, the bill risks making service delivery significantly worse. Um, now, I'm acutely aware of the social care crisis we've got in the capital at this present time, but what disruptions do you think could arise as a result of this bill? And what are the Scottish Government telling you to um, allay these fears? Um, Paula, I'll maybe bring you in as I specifically... Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think the fears that we allude to are, are very real. We have a, a workforce that's been under pressure for a long time um, in a market that's very competitive for that scale pay scale of, of role um, 
and recruiting is incredibly difficult and retention is now difficult. At the same time, we've got an ageing workforce for whom, after going through a pandemic and everything that's come over the last number of years, and I suppose the challenges of the, the role in, in, in the round, to then have to face change, change of employer, change of relationships, teams around you. There's a very real, um, and some parts of, of the council would argue already manifesting, kind of d pressure on retaining our staff um, and, you know, decisions that they may make now not to continue in their roles and so on, exacerbating the challenges that we're under. So there's, there's, I suppose that's what we mean when we, we say disruption in terms of the workforce. Um, but then there's also that inability to plan because you don't know how long you're planning for because of the ambiguity around the bill and the intentions of the government. And that also causes, um, exacerbates the first problem and causes more strategic challenges for the council in um, investing in changing, reforming our services in order to manage the pressures that are there right now. Yeah, Th thank you for that. And I, I think I would agree with all of those concerns. You know, given the specific pressures Edinburgh's facing over delayed discharge, um, highest and I think almost half of all delayed discharges here in the capital, likewise with homelessness, number of children in temporary accommodation, um, that whole restructuring can cannot help really tackle those problems um, specifically at this moment in time. Um, to widen this out, earlier in the earlier session we heard um, the challenges which are likely to come from transferring 75,000 local authority staff to a, a new national care service. Um, now I wondered, and specifically we heard uh, the concern around that pension issue uh, also being raised, which wasn't necessarily there with Police Scotland and the fire uh, service um, when they were centralised in 2013. But I wondered um, what the panel thought, what lessons had been learnt anyway from the creation of a national police service and, and fire service and what pitfalls we're maybe seeing with a national care service. So does anyone want to come in on, on that question? Michelle, then go around. I suppose it's not really clear what lessons have been learned. We hope lessons have been learned, that some of the same um, examples have come up, uh, specifically around VAT. And I think you, you heard from your earlier panel, and, and I would completely agree, the pensions um, issue is is much more fundamental in this case due to the number of staff in, in, in one pension arrangement. Um, in terms of staffing, I think what we worry about the most is that it's not really clear from the bill how reserved employment law to pay pensions um, and case law, not to get into too much detail, have been considered and therefore mm -hmm. um, how those staffing arrangements will be, will be implemented and the effect on staff back at the ranch also is something that, that it wasn't necessarily um, an issue for other reorganisations. So um, not clear that lessons have been learned because we don't have the detail to, sure. to make that, that uh, judgment. I, I think, you know, like, clearly with some of the risks that we can all talk about, is there is a wide, you know, like, understanding of what, what went wrong almost the last time and some of the things that went well, you know, and so, so I actually understand it for that. Where this is different, I think, is what we were seeing was bringing together our Scottish police services, bringing together our Scottish fire services. That's not what's going to happen here. So what would happen here would there be a transfer of local authority staff to the National Care Service. There would be no tra transfer of national health staff. There would be no transfer of independent service staff. There would be no transfer of voluntary service staff. So it's not the same type of integration that, that we've seen before. And I think, you know, that the, the differences there are really, really significant. And we focused on, as I mentioned earlier, the difference between terms and conditions of public service staff with people in independent and, and you know, voluntary sector would need to be considered, but also just the overall the fair work you know, agenda that we want to get into here. Th this is significantly different that you're talking about at least four different you know, types of staff actually going to be overall you know, like participating to the National Care Service which is commissioned and directly delivered, whereas previously you were bringing together a police service or bringing together mm -hmm. a fire service. This is a much more complicated you know, yeah. issue. Yeah. Can I 
add one one point? Um, we in Edinburgh have really strong, I'm going to preface my comment, we have really strong relationships with our police and fire colleagues, both strategically and um, at a very local level. But I would also say that the national, uh, the centralisation of those services has, has definitely detrimentally impacted their local flexibility in terms of budgets and assets in particular. So it is more difficult to make locally appropriate decisions in respect of the use of, of budgets and um, buildings uh, and capital assets. So, uh, and we have seen that come through the system. So if you are really focused on trying to make community planning and community empowerment and local responsive services work, that hasn't necessarily been a byproduct of centralisation of police and fire. Thank, thank you for that. And Douglas, did you want to come in or? No, I think um, just at the end, Paula's point there he was very much along the lines of what I had wanted to contribute. Um, the, the, the point about the, something to be wary of the, in terms of the NCS um, about a lack of local involvement, engagement um, by the new organisation. Uh, there are some lessons to be learned or uh, warning signs to be picked up in terms of uh, what, has ha what has happened with police and fire. Uh, so just, I think, as I say, Paula has covered the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. Interesting time. Um, thanks, Miles. And um, that concludes our questions. And I just want to say thank you very much for coming in. It's been good to hear a level of detail from all of you. And I know we could have talked a lot longer, um, but we've got um, your written evidence as well. So really, uh, on behalf of the committee, we really appreciate you being with us today. And I now uh, suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a change of witnesses.
We're now joined by our final panel of witnesses today, which will explore housing and homelessness issues. And we're joined by Ewan Aitken, who's the chief executive of the Cyrenians and representing Everyone Home Collective. Yvette Burgess, who's the unit director at the Coalition of Care Providers Scotland, otherwise known as CCPS. Uh, Ashley Campbell, who's the policy and practice manager at the Chartered Institute of Housing Scotland. Eileen McMullen, who's the policy lead from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and Shay Moran, who's, from, uh, who's the change lead from the All In For Change group. And um, welcome today. And I would like to begin uh, with the first couple of questions. Um, I'm interested to hear if the witnesses agree with the Feely Review um, that, the, that the COVID pandemic demonstrated clearly that the Scottish public expect national accountability for adult social care support and look to Scottish ministers to provide that accountability. So it's the same question I've asked for all of the panels, and um, if anyone wants to indicate they'd like to pick that up. I, I, I've no doubt that there would be general agreement that reform was required and that people needed to go, they needed to know who to go to to ask questions when things go wrong and that some of their experiences of asking the people who previously appeared to be responsible were not good. Um, I, I'm less convinced that people then thought, well, if we put somebody at the top in charge, it'll all be sorted. Um, I, 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 that felt like a bit more of a leap um, than the critique, which was probably accurate, um, actually justified. Thank you, Mark. Irene? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, to be honest, I think people be already believed that um, the, the government was, was responsible for, for care, although it's delivered locally, um, given that there is a already a department for um, that looks at health health and social care. I don't think necessarily that that, that drew them would draw them to the conclusion of what's been currently proposed. Because Thanks. obviously the ministers are accountable for what, what goes on in local government as well. Thank you. Anybody else comment on that? Shay? I would say that since most of the guidance that people were hearing on a daily basis through various news broadcasts was coming from the centralised Scottish Government and from Nicola Sturgeon's updates, people were definitely looking to the Scottish Government for overall support and regulation, but they were still very much looking to their local authorities and local services to provide on-the-ground care and support and assistance where required. Thanks. Ashley? Um, I would just add that the, the pandemic really shone a light on the role of housing and supporting people within their local communities as well. It's maybe slightly off topic, but I feel it's worth mentioning that housing really was a, a cornerstone for people receiving the kind of support that they needed, that housing providers themselves, local authorities, housing associations, local communi community groups really played a very strong role in ensuring that people had the basic needs um, to, to support them throughout the, the pandemic. And I think just to make a really strong point at the beginning that housing really is key to prevention, to supporting people and to improving health and wellbeing outcomes within the community as well. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, my next question I'm going to direct um, to you, Yvette, um, initially. Um, it, and it's around the uh, IJBs and the third sector. Um, what is the third sector's current involvement in IJBs and do third sector organisations feel they are partners in the design and delivery of social care within the current system? Well, I think it varies. Um, in some areas, third sector partners are, are more involved. But I think what we've learnt since IJBs came into to being is that um, it, it's, it's more than just structure. We need to to really make sure that those relationships at a local level are embedded. And definitely issues around commissioning need to be looked at to make sure that commissioning of social care services is more collaborative and that third sector partners are, are play a re can play a really important part in that along with other partners um, in terms of delivery. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in, Eileen? Can I just add to that? Because um, if you're including housing associations in third sector, 
Um, I think that it is similar. It varies quite considerably. Some housing associations work really effectively with them, uh, with their IJB partners, and in other areas, it's less, uh, less so. Um, but I think again, um, it's more about the contribution that they make in terms of the whole kind of area of prevention and supporting people to live independently. That's often uh, overlooked and, and continues to be so. Thanks, and you in. Yeah, I would also say that that varies is not one's good and one's bad. Varies is because different communities have different approaches. So I sat on um, I'm Midlothian IJB for three years as a rep and had a very it was able to have a very clear contribution and um, an equal nature. In fact, like, we, we never, I don't think we ever had a vote. We were, we were each collective decisions. Um, and I had a relationship with a referral group um, to do that, so I was able to bring the views of that. Um, in East Lothian, uh, there's been a um, work to do a joint planning process between the, the, the two um, the two sectors to really build, build that stuff up. Um, our experience of working in Falkirk, which is, again, a different size, and I think size is, is often the challenge in terms of the different capacities. Um, the, the, the conversation we have, we're able to have with them as an organisation directly is a result of the space that they create for those conversations that aren't directly at the board, but because of the conversations they have before the board, the board is able to make the, the decisions we'd hope, them to, hope to make. Whereas in Edinburgh, because it's so much bigger, it's three organisations representing and it needs to feed back in a very different way because it's quite complex to manage that size. So the varied is a necessary part of the structure we have at the moment rather than one is good and one is bad. Mm. Uh, I really appreciate that clarification on the varied because I was going to ask a bit more about that. So it's been really helpful. I'm now going to move to questions from Willie Coffey. Thanks very much again, convener. Um, the previous panel, two panels, were it pains to emphasise, I think, the local variability in delivery of service. Um, we do have information and evidence from, for example, Improvement Services Local Government Benchmarking Framework that does show differences in performance, not differences in how service is delivered, but actual performance differences. That I think the National Care Service is trying to improve and make consistent. Why, why do you think those differences are there? Is it down to localism only? Or are there real differences in performance and the level of service that people get across Scotland? Maybe start with you, Ian. So the question is, you know, should you run to that solution before you've asked the question about um, why, why, that, why that is? And what's the, the, what's the, what's the root of those performance differences? Because there's no doubt that people um, have different experiences across the board. Sometimes that's driven by geography, sometimes it's driven by finance, sometimes it's driven by politics, it has to be said. Um, but there are, there are questions to be asked about that. This, this, to my mind, though, comes to the point about accountability. And it seems to me odd to say in the first instance, yet we need to make sure that there's a consistency of quality, not how it's delivered, but the quality of what is delivered in every different, a different place, um, and therefore have that accountability um, a, a design, designed locally and people being able to call to account for that and then push the accountability up the way and actually distance the accountability from where um, where actually it needs to happen, because if you're going to have locally designed services, those people locally are the people who are going to be making the decisions, they by necessity need to, unless they're always going to have to punt everything up the way, first of all, before it can back down the way, which would seem to me to be a long way around for a shortcut to get where we want to get to. So I'm, I'm unconvinced that, that creating a, mo a model of centralised accountability will deal with the issue that you rightly identify, which is, in some places, we've not got what we need to the standard we need. Other comments from the panel? Ashley? Um, I think I would agree with what Ewan was just saying. We all want to see better outcomes for individuals and for communities. That I don't think that's in question. And in terms of the, the bill and the National Care Service, we certainly appreciate and agree with the principles of, of the bill in terms of creating um, more consistency of outcomes, in terms of having a, a person-centred approach, human rights approach to providing services, that all sounds great on paper. And I think in terms of differences in, in performance, um, I guess the, the first thing to state is that local authorities, all 32 of them, are operating within very different contexts and they'll have different 
local variations in um, the economy, whether you're working within an urban or a rural, rural context, can have a, a big impact on housing need and affordability and the types of services that people need. So I agree with you and about that kind of need to be looking at local solutions for local people and local decision making. Um, I, I think it's a bit unclear to me um, from the structure of the bill whether whether the proposal or the proposed structure is going to going to fix those issues or not. And I think it's difficult to tell when there's so little detail in the bill about what ultimately the National Care Service will look like. But we do agree there is an inconsistency across Scotland in delivering the, delivering the outcomes that we all seek. It is inconsistent. So how do we get there without a, a, a national model that could apply those standards as Eddie Fraser described earlier? How do we how do we improve consistently in the authorities perhaps where we need to without that national application of standards? You can come back, sales. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that what you need to do is do the the, the good things that are in there: ethical procurement, um, a human rights approach, a single electronic record. All those things would make a huge difference. But you do not. I'm yet to be convinced. Um, uh, that this level of structural change will, will – because actually you're pushing everything upwards, and I, I have to say when I asked the question why are um, all the, the local authorities being uh, uh, staff being transferred, the answer given was because the minister – and, and not NHS ones – the answer was because the minister's already in charge of them. You know, so clearly the culture is to push it upwards, whereas actually these solutions are required – you could do – um, culture change in things without having a massive and level of, a high level of disruptive um, uh, structural change. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, there's evidence already of, of methodologies of doing that that we've done, I would argue, within the promise, I think within, actually within the Ending Homeless Together plan, both massive, massive shifts in how we approach dealing with intractable problems um, with new, new lines of accountability um, but without having to create a, a new structure that actually removes accountability from the place where you're trying to actually have the, the decisions made using local resources, local understanding and local wisdom. Okay. Thank you very much. Very clear, Ian. Thank you for that. Um, maybe a second question um, to Yvette, if I, I may. Yvette, your submission talked about the importance of flexibility and collaboration at the local level, and indeed other witnesses talked about that at great length this morning also. Do you think, do you feel that those issues are, are, are threatened by the bill or can they be enhanced, retained, protected by the bill? What, what are your views on that? So at CCPS there's been some work to develop a model of change and this was very much in line with the, adult, the, the review of adult social care and the Feely report. So taking those principles and looking at whole system change rather than simply structural change and a very much um, a desire to improve outcomes for individuals but making sure that individuals at the heart of decision making um, making sure that social care is transferable between areas and through different stages of life, making sure that a whole systems approach does include all those other services that um, contribute to people's well-being, particularly housing. Um, so, and very much focusing on the sort of cultural changes that are needed which accept that social care at its best is about relationships. It's a relational um, activity rather than um, a sort of transactional type of activity. So that's the sort of model of change that CCPS is, has been developing. And so it, we've been able to then look at the bill and look at the extent to which, or we are still in the process of doing that, to be fair, um, we're looking at the bill to see at the extent to which the bill does promote that. And we do have concerns about the focus on structural change, um, the lack of detail at this stage, and as many other witnesses have said today, a concern that a lot is being left to um, secondary legislation and a feeling that, um, that people who should be at the heart of all of this 
are, are not actually at that stage of involvement yet. Um, it's great that the um, bill does include the, pro the principle of co-design, but actually we've not actually seen that in evidence it, to get to this stage. And so in terms of primary legislation, it's really important that um, people with lived experience, a diverse range of lived experience should be involved at that stage. Thank you. Any other comments on that issue about flexibility and collaboration? Are we going to lose it or can we retain it and develop it with the bill? Um, it's, it's really not to add very much. It's just to, to really agree with what people have said. And I think at the moment, well, it's really important. The, the principles set out in the bill um, are, look really good. It's really difficult to see currently how that would be translated into a care service and practice. OK. Good to see you another hand there, Ashley. <laughs> Um, I'll just add the Integration Act in 2014. I, I don't think anybody thinks that that had the impact that we wanted it to in terms of housing, health and, and social care working more closely together. I think principally it was a health and social care integration act and then housing seems like it was kind of pinned on at the end. So there was health, uh, housing contribution statements and a little bit partnership working, but not the kind of the kind of deep partnership working that we would like to see and able to be able to um, have impact on national outcomes and the Scottish Government's commitments to things like ending homelessness, to supporting people to live independently in their own, own home for as long as possible, to make sure that people are able to age within their communities. Housing is really key to achieving those, but only in partnership with health and social care. So I guess um, looking at this optimistically, the National Care Service does provide an opportunity to change the way that that partnership works. But we've also heard um, a lot of concern from our members and others in the housing sector about the risks of breaking down the relationships that have been built since 2014. So in terms of housing working well with IJBs, um, we've done quite a lot of work with local authorities over the last year or so around implementation of rapid rehousing transition plans and how they're transforming homelessness services. And the only way that we can do that really well is with input from health and social care. So we asked local authorities how that was, was going. And about half of local authorities, um, we got 30 responses out of 32, so it was a big, big sample. About half said that their IJB wasn't giving enough priority to their rapid rehousing transition plan. The other half that were more positive um, said that where things were working, it was because they'd built up those local relationships. And they were working differently in different areas, um, but because housing departments and homelessness departments had spent the last six or more years working on those relationships, there's concern that if you know, we, we scrap IGBs and start again from scratch, that that progress could be lost. And where does that leave people that really need those services and rely on those services and that are so essential to supporting people with complex needs um, who might be homeless, to supporting people to live independently in their own homes if they're ageing or have a disability or maybe developing dementia. So I think there's potential, but there's also big risks and that's where a lot of the concern lies. Thank you for that, Ashley. Thank you very much. Thanks, yep. We're going to move to questions from Paul McClellan. Yeah, you. You know, and, and actually, it's really just leading on from the point, point you made, and the question is, to, to what extent does the bill adequately reflect the role of housing and homelessness services in improving the quality and consistency of social services, leading to the improved outcomes? I think you kind of touched on, on that one. I don't know if you want to say anything else, and then I'll try and open it up to the panel, but it, it kind of led into the question really well. The bill, as it stands, that the role of housing and homelessness is adequately reflected, and that's something that we would be really keen to see if this is taken forward, that housing is embedded um, within the structure and you know, the, the importance of it is reflected. Um, I think, as I've, I've said before, housing is essential to all those big Scottish government commitments to supporting people to live well at home, to ending homelessness, to tackling poverty, to, to net zero, whatever the national outcome is. You know, homelessness is really core to, to achieving that. So I think at the very least, what we would want to see from this new structure, whatever it ends up looking like, is a really strong message from both national government and from local government about the importance of the role of housing and making sure that there is better partnership working. And as I said before, in some areas it is working well, but that seems to be because relationships have kind of orga organically grown and developed rather than any kind of structural, um, any structure that's in place. So I think the messaging is very clear. And we are starting to see that with things like the prevention bill, um, pre prevention duty, the Scottish Government is sending that message that homelessness is not just a housing issue. It needs support from a range of partners and the same with independent living as well. Housing can't do everything on its own. It needs that support from health and social care as well. 
I was just going to because again you can touch on the second point which leads me in well and I'll, I'll open up to the panel about the two points but the, the second point was really around about um, agreeing with the Scottish Government's reason for excluding homeless service, services from the remit of the National Care Service I think you've kind of answered that one as well you think that's really important and that's, that's part of the process whatever it looks like going, can you going forward part of the process whether that's built in as a kind of statutory part of the structure or whether mm -hmm. it is about um, clearer messaging and direction about the role um, as I said previously, it's, it's difficult to comment when there's so little detail in the bill about the makeup of care boards or what that structure looks like on the ground. But certainly, we want to see the importance of housing and homelessness acknowledged. I'm going to open it up a bit beyond that. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that on that point. Two two questions. <coughs> it, it, it does seem odd to use um, the rationale of a, a of a of decisions that were taken or something you're going to break up to say, well, they got everything else wrong, but we're going to say that was right. And actually, it's not quite true to say that they were excluded. They were given the option of included. Yeah. And the reason for that was that the delivery um, of services need to be designed in the right way for that local area. So what was required in one place because of the, the, the you know, for Edinburgh example, because of the high pressures of homelessness would be very different to Orkney. And they needed that level of flexibility. And that was why. So you were saying we want to devolve that decision. And then you devolve the decision. And because some people, one decision and some people took another decision, you're saying, oh, well, we'll, 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 we'll agree with this law and not this law. It seems to me to be unwise to, 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 to start from that that, pers that perspective. Um, what we're looking for is, is seamless access to the range of care that somebody requires at the point of presentation. We know that 50% of those who present as homeless to local councils, who will still, by the way, have the statutory duty from the 1983 Act, because I do understand that's not going to be transferred over, they need, you need to be able to show that whatever we've created People have a, a seamlessness duty. 50% who present don't require support, but 50% do. So how do you make sure that the access to the, pers the, the report support that that person requires, not every person, but that person at that moment requires, is absolutely seamless? Um, and, and there's nothing that suggests at the moment that how that would be, how would that be achieved? So saying it's in or out, actually, I think rather misses the point. It's about what do we design for those people who are in that circumstance in this place, given the resources they have? That needs to be the conversation before you start talking about who's in charge. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, could I, could I oh, just add yeah. some... Because um, I think, I mean, well, there's very little detail in the bill, but, but there's nothing in it really at all about uh, the potential contribution of housing um, and the homelessness sector to, um, to support the government's wider agendas around support and independence, around prevention. Um, and I think, it, I mean, it links across to so many areas of key public service delivery and the partnership working, which you've heard a lot about today, I think, with, with health and social care, where it works well, it works really well for people. And I think um, it, it was a miss in the last, uh, the creation of the health and social care partnerships to kind of, um, uh, to ex exclude or leave out housing. Um, what happened subsequently um, kind of meant it was an add-on. Um, and I think, just to pick up on Ashley's point, it's really important that that's actually central, um, a, a central part of um, working uh, collaboratively with the National Care Service. Um, and I think, I mean, I think it's important to say that the wider agenda with the focus on prevention uh, and supporting independence, it can't actually be delivered if housing isn't involved and recognised as a key strategic partner. Um, I mean, good care is only delivered where people live. Um, and and, and, and sort of safe housing, appropriate, adaptable housing is all um, really important to achieve that. So I think, you know, the arguments are for all of that are really well rehearsed, but and it was quite disappointing to see that there was nothing in the bill uh, that reflected some of that. I think the other thing I would just want to add is about in, in homelessness. I mean, if you actually look at what the government has been doing around preventing homelessness, it recognises there that homelessness is a shared public responsibility. And again, that isn't reflected in anything that's um, uh, been said so far in the National Care Service Bill. I don't know if anyone else wants to come. Yeah, sure. 
I would just echo a couple of the points, really. Uh, firstly, the fact that obviously with the preven uh, prevention duties consultation, the Scottish Government and other bodies have acknowledged that homelessness is not just a housing issue. Uh, secondly, though, I would completely agree that the bill in its current state does not reflect the needs of the homeless population as far as housing is concerned. And the two messages that that's sending really seems to be a divergence from the overall message that we have previously put out with the prevention duties consultation. As far as how that looks for people on the ground with lived experience, there is a lot of confusion or doubt as to how or if uh, the bill is actually going to affect them in their daily lives, if it is going to have any benefits or positive, uh, positive outcome on how they receive care or access care. At the moment, most people that I speak to, if I mention the National Care Service, they don't think that it's something that is going to be of any relevance to them as far as their uh, journey through homelessness to finding a permanent home as it stands at the moment. And where people do have any thoughts or opinions on it, it does tend to be towards the more negative aspects where they now feel that having this divergence from care away from uh, housing and homelessness services. They feel that the support they currently receive from many, say, homelessness charities or organisations or local authorities is going to be uh, minimised uh, or taken away from them in some aspect because it is so intrinsically linked as it stands at the moment. Okay. Do you want to contribute um, to that one? Yes. Think... Picking up on that point about the support, and um, at the Housing Support Enabling Unit, we work with housing support providers and supported housing pro providers across Scotland. And it does strike me that housing support itself, and by housing support in this context of homelessness, I'm thinking of the um, preventative type of housing support, as right through to the more critical, intensive housing support that people who are facing homelessness might call on. So in there, there's something about prevention. And it's really important, I think, that we don't lose sight of that and that we don't lose that. And it's, it's great that the, one of the principles is all around prevention. But we really need to see what that um, is going to look like in the bill. We, we, we haven't got that sense yet of just how much priority will be given to those um, services that are looking ahead to helping people avoid situations like homelessness, which we know um, greatly uh, reduce the, um, their outcomes. So it's really just to keep an eye on the prevention and, and also maybe just to highlight that in the current system, we have a housing support assessment that goes on when people do present as homelessness. Um, that's not necessarily in homeless departments, uh, housing departments, but it is often in a housing department. Um, but obviously it's really important that there are smooth links into um, the right sort of support, whether that's specialist support for addictions or other types of support, or whether it's long-term support. And, and that's where it's so crucial that any new national care service should really um, make that pathway a smooth one. And there needs to be some recognition of that, I think, in the bill. At the moment, we're not clear where housing support fits in with the, the new vision for the national care service. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks Paul. Um, Annie, do you have questions you want to pick up? Yes, I do. Good morning, panel. Thanks, convener. Um, the, CP the CCPS has submission suggests an alternative model in which the primary change drivers will be cultural in the form of relationships and behaviours embodied in the system. And I was just wondering if Yvette could expand on what is meant by this and how this approach could be reflected in the bill. So I think one of the ways it could do that is by looking at the way services are planned and commissioned and procured. So it needs to be more collaborative than it currently is. Um, obviously, there is, some, there is some flexibility already. So um, collaboration is possible under existing legislation, but it's often not used. And more often than not, housing support services, other types of care services and housing services are designed without enough collaboration with potential partners and delivery partners. And, um, 
providers are put in a position of competing against each other, whereas it's much uh, better, the outcomes are much better when um, those people who are potential users of services, existing service users as well, are involved just as well as those who are potentially going to provide the service. Would anyone else like to come in on that? Or I'm happy. Anyone? No? Um, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks. That was, that, was, that was great. It's good to hear of an alternative. Uh, I'm now going to move to a question from Miles Briggs. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think some of my questions around um, the impact it will have on homelessness uh, prevention legislation, I think, have been touched upon. But I wanted to expand specifically around third sector involvement, because I think one of the key criticisms we did see at the time of the integration of health and social care was the third sector not being at the table and therefore not being at a chance to influence uh, decision making. And do you think this has changed in any way in terms of um, the early stages of development of the National Care Service? You happy to bring it? No, in fact, um, the members of the third sector and in fact the Homeless Prevention Strategy Group, which is a group um, made up of third sector and, and the Scottish Government, put in um, strong views to the Feely uh, uh, review, asking for homelessness to be at the heart of this and housing, and, 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 it, and it wasn't, and it's felt like that's, that's continued, and we've had to continually fight to, 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 to get there. We're told that we'll be part of the co-design, but it's difficult to see how that, that is the case. And our concern is that we're doing it the wrong way around. We should be... I mean, we do co-design all the time. As do, as do colleagues. That's what we do. That's in our d and And what you do is you design the thing you want based on the evidence you have and the, and the lived experience and so on. And then you work out who needs to take what, what decisions when and he needs to have what powers to make sure that that can happen. And how is that held to co accountable for quality and standards and so on and so forth. This feels like it's come the other way around. So although we're going to be in... Uh, it would appear we may be able to be part of the conversations in the design we're already not being heard by saying this is the wrong way around and that our contribution will be limited by the fact that the methodology that's been used is 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 not um uh, is, is not the one that, that that we would use and you know there's been there's a recent report on evidence of national systems of social care in, in nordic and scandinavian countries and they were clear it's it's all about the roles and responsibilities and that's what we would argue. It is all about that. that that's the most important thing, r r rather than the balance between centralised and decentralised um, uh, decision-making. And that's always our experience about designing things. You design things so that people know whose job it is to do what and how you, how you nurture the quality of relationships that mean that the right things will happen. Um, and that's where we would be starting, rather than um, we've, we've got this structure, designed something to fit the structure. On that. Can I just um, can I just add because I think just when we talk about the third sector, but we often ignore um, the role that housing associations play and mm -hmm. um, all of that because they are significant providers of care and support, specialist housing pathways, mm -hmm. uh, aid and adaptations, all the rest of it, um, and they're in a similar position I think in terms of how the IGBs currently work. Um, so and, and again, we've talked about the variation for for quite good reason often, but the Borders Council, for example, housing associations are very involved mm -hmm. um, in, in um, the planning and development of, of uh, policy in, in, in that area with their IJB. And again, um, we don't see, well, I haven't seen anything in the current bill that, that, that picks that up yeah. and look, um, suggests that that might carry on. Yeah. And it is that then a missed opportunity? Because I totally agree with what you said there. I think here in Edinburgh, some of the, the key challenges around delayed discharge, homelessness, have actually been because homeless um, housing associations are not part of that integrated joint board work as well. So I don't know if this is going to be forced through by the government. Where's the repose to try to include housing, do you, do you think, in this? Or isn't there going to be one? Sorry? In terms of being able to get housing into this discussion, where would you think that can now take place, or is it just not going to happen? Well, I, th I mean, I think there is an opportunity, I think, and I actually touched on, touched on that earlier on. I think if, if it does go through, then there's an opportunity to, to change, hopefully, um, some of that structure um, as it passes through Parliament so that we can see some of those um, things 
um, included. And even, you know, it's, I mean, whatever the, is set up, whether it's a care board or an IGB, some uh, recognition that there needs to be some kind of duty to collaborate with housing and homelessness mm -hmm. sectors in order to deliver. But because, as you said, there's lots of evidence um, around um, improvements in discharge from hospital, in preventing crisis admissions um, to hospital and supporting people to stay at home for longer, which only can happen if, if housing is actually part of that um, planning and development process. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Kabina. Thanks, Miles. I'm now going to move to questions from Marie McNair. Uh, thank you, Kabina, and good afternoon, uh, panel. Um, you and the Scottish Government argue that the reason much of the design is left for later regulations and policy is that um, so it can be co-designed with those uh, with lived experience. Uh, what is the expectations of co-designing the National Care Service and what especially would you like to see in that regard? I know you've touched on a bit uh, on this already, but anything else you'd like to maybe raise? So, um, I think I've indicated, I think that, that we've done this the, the, the wrong, way, wrong way around. But if you look at you know, two examples of good co-design getting to a place where the right legislation is then put in place. They would be the promise and the ending of homelessness together. Both of these started with people with lived experience and frontline staff, built it up, worked out what, what, was, what was needed, and then the appropriate legislation was, was developed. And, you know, I, I, I think that this often underplayed what was achieved, particularly around the ending homelessness together programme um, uh, uh, agreement, which incredible level of sign up across sectors you didn't have people when that was signed saying i'm against it right across the the public and and third sector people were up up for it and it used a tool the rapid uh, the rapid rehousing transition plan tool which then said that everybody's got to have one of these and everybody will have to count for its delivery um uh, but you need to design it for the area for your area, given the resources you've got. So you've got something that's maintaining standards with clear lines of accountability, with who's in charge. Um, there are challenges. It's not perfect, as was referenced earlier. Some of the relationships aren't where they need to be, but actually some of them are really, really good. And we're part of the stuff we've got in the borders with the delivery of housing first, where that relationship really works. And you don't unpick the whole thing because some people didn't get it right. And all, all of that is an example of how you do co-design in a way that begins from bottom up and then gets to the legislation that, that you require. And I think the promise is another example of that. And I, I, would, I would urge them to say, do we really need such structural change to sort out some specific issues? Or do we need to say, let's start from where people are at and build the right programme to get the cultural change that we know we need? And as I said earlier, I think, you know, the, the, the voice of lived experience certainly tells you we need a single electronic, electronic record. We, cer we certainly need a human rights approach. So those are good things. Let's not lose them. But we don't need to rebuild the whole thing to get to where we need to get to. And I think that's the kind of approach to co-design that we should take. Really helpful. Anyone else want to come in? I know we're kind of <laughs> uh, push for time, but I think we really get a few more in. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> the point where we are with the, the bill already having been introduced, I appreciate the commitment to a co-design process. And I think a lot of concerns arise from the fact that there isn't a lot of detail in the bill. And I understand the, the argument that that can be developed down the line with more input from service users, people with lived experience. I would also like to see housing and homelessness organisations in there as well. I think the really difficult bit is to sign up to a completely unknown. I think you'll probably have heard this quite a lot through mm. the evidence sessions, but on the face of the bill, it's very difficult to see what it's going to look like in practice. So it's difficult for us to, to support that and say, yes, this is definitely the, the right course of action. Um, as I've said previously, I think it does raise opportunities. And it would be a real missed opportunity if housing and homelessness wasn't integrated um, more centrally within whatever the new structure looks like. So I think there are potential opportunities, but there's big risks as well. And those are where the concerns are coming across. Thank you. I'll just move on to the end of my last question. Um, Eileen, uh, a number of uh, council expressed concerns um, that in the short to medium term, the bill risks making service delivery significantly worse. What disruptions could arise uh, as a result of the bill and what can the Scottish Government do to allay fears? Um, I, think, um, I think you've heard quite a lot today, but I think I would tend to agree. And, um, it creates enough, because of the lack of detail at the moment, there's such a lot of uncertainty over what mm -hmm. is going to happen. 
Um, and and I think um, it's not clear how that will improve the, fl the flexibility, the integration that, that is desired and everybody um, wants. Um, I think people's experience of um, setting up the IJBs, um, there was a feeling for quite a long time, there was a kind of planning blight as everybody focused on the structural change that actually happened and people weren't clear about who was going to be doing what, what responsibilities, how they would be able to think about, say, future of supported housing. Um, uh, so I think there's a real risk that we could face, we could face that. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a couple of things that are kind of bubbling away at the moment. So the coming home report um, that, that was commissioned by the yeah. Scottish Government, for example, um, talks about bringing lots of people mm -hmm. with land disabilities and complex Just needs into, uh, back into the local areas. Um, I think with the uncertainty over what's happening, again, you've got risks around housing developments, particularly for that, that client group. Um, how is it going to be funded? Who's going to be in charge of running it? How is it going to be commissioned? I think there's a real risk that all of those kind of things go into kind of, I don't know, um, they, they stop happening until we're clear about what the structure's uh, going, going, to look, going to look like. So, uh, and I think the reason why that's a problem is because there's such a lot of issues at the moment around workforce, um, around the funding, I mean, Yvette's mentioned commissioning as well. Um, there's real concerns. There's people that have got contracts at the moment, um, which may be ending. Mm -hmm. So there's real concerns that we basically get into a situation where nobody's clear about what to do, so nobody does anything. Um, so that that's, I think, a potential uh, risk there. Mm -hmm. So that in practice as well. Can you there any more time just to... Yeah, well, no. just, if you keep answers brief yeah, to Marie's can... question... Um, anyone else want to come in, Shay? Sure. I think one of the main concerns uh, that I've seen people having is the potential for further delays to the implementation of what will be essential services. We've already seen in the RRTPs, uh, I believe from every local authority, a renewed commitment to the implementation, for example, of Housing First or the expansion of Housing First and the implementation mm -hmm. of Housing First for Youth. One of the core principles of that is, of course, the wraparound care, not just the housing aspects of things. And by having a complete restructure of all of the care-based services, there are a lot of concerns that this is going to cause unnecessary delays or require the complete uh, redesign of any possible implementation of these services that are going to be essential for many people experiencing homelessness now and in the future. Uh, in particular, my concern would be around we have finally got uh, commitments for Housing First for Youth, which has always been on a very small scale in Scotland and is very new. Having any delays to any possible expansion of that or implementation of that in new local authorities, I believe, would be detrimental to many young people currently experiencing homelessness or at risk of it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevina. Thanks. Thanks, Marie. Um, so, yeah, so that concludes our evidence session uh, today and I just want to say thank you very much for coming. It's been another layer um, and very good to get your perspectives on, on uh, the situation of housing and homelessness. Um, we will be taking further evidence on the National Care Service Bill at our next meeting on the 5th of November and uh, we agreed at the start of the meeting to take the next two items in private. So as we have no more public business today, I now close the public part of the meeting.